Junglers dumber than you are reaching Challenger. How does that make you feel? You've put in hundreds to thousands of games, so have they. So they must be League of Legends strategy gods or mechanical beasts, right? No, every Challenger jungler started out just where you are, slogging through those games, learning the ins and outs of jungle, but it's not just about deep game mechanics or perfect skill execution. And it might not even be about the 99 perfect Challenger tricks, it's about doing. It's about giving yourself permission to fail and learn. And of course, maybe one or two tricks that they learn to master along the way. And that maybe you think are beneath you. Let's go ahead and make 100,000 Challenger junglers with this video, shall we? And so we begin. So if you pay attention to the channel as we go through these clears pretty quickly, you will note that the red side quadrant clear is kind of the meta in that it's mostly done by everybody. However, a lot of junglers, especially in anything below master tier, still like to full clear blindly. So what you can do is position yourself in a way to counter them. I've covered that fully as well, but I'll leave a few highlights on your screen. Now you can see the diversity of options we have with this clear, but the clear you're seeing the cane do now is the one that you don't see that often. I've done my raptors, my red, my krugs. I've looked bottom lane. Hey, it's not gankable. I know the enemy jungle starter top side is going down, but I can do nothing about that. Therefore, I'm going to go back to base very quickly, verse looping from Krugs to the Wolves, because I can get there really fast as Kane as whatever jungler I'm playing, Nunu as well, Hecarim, Shivana, and so on. But the point more so is, hey, I've got a bit of an item advantage. I can keep my good sequencing for the respawn of the camps, right? The Wolves into the Grump, so that when they respawn again, when I eventually come back, they're nicely tied together into my blue, into the Scuttle. What does that mean that Zack has been doing this whole time? If he showed bottom lane at all, I'll know exactly where he is and what he's doing. If he doesn't show, he's probably done a full clear plus scuttle. This means that we can 2v2 in the mid lane as we expect him to gank. Then we have the absolute same result, except we meet him there with a long sword advantage. Kinda good. And now because we showed up here in this environment, the bottom lane are gonna think, haha, Kane's done a full clear up. There we go. And they're not gonna pay attention to the fact that he's already base. So he's going to take his base form and say, look, I understand the vision control bottom lane. I've seen it, I've observed it. Yeah, my raptors are respawning followed by my krugs. Why don't I just go ahead and circumvent that vision by queuing over the dragon pit wall and then eing around having a beautiful angle of approach such that we get a guaranteed kill. Don't chase his support, kill the ADC. Thumbs up. So what our challenger Kane did here that was so beautiful was not only did he look for a ganking route ahead of his enemy jungler, let me do something that gets me ahead of what they want to do. If I take that away, that's wonderful. If I cannot, I'm still primed to match them in the mid lane. Then because he's going to be going back to base, I now have tempo control to gank bottom lane before he arrives again. Let me do that considering they're overcommitting committing and disrespecting me. And hey, guess what? You can rule break in whatever champion you want. You've seen the cane do it. Hecarim could have just ran down the river. Nunu could have just snowballed down the river. Most junglers could get around vision there in some capacity or just go through it fast enough that you could still end up getting a kill on the Ezreal. That's the point. But now you look at it and you're like, well, hey, I can just do a full sequence, right? Krugs have just spawned, Raptors, Wolves, Grump have all respawned. Wow. So not only have we had a good dynamic early game in terms of trying to control the jungle tempo, we've impacted lanes twice. We've secured all our camps twice. We got a Scuttle Crab. The Zac makes a pretty smooth play of just saying, hey, I can't match this 44 CS is a first rotation of Scuttle plus a second rotation of clears. Let me go ahead and, you know, just do the dragon. I saw Kane go through mid lane. I saw him gank bottom lane. I know he's going to take all his camps and go to the top side. I can snack this objective easily. Kane can now say, hey, I see that. I understand that. You can take the green dragon, my green friend. I'm going to take the scuttle crab, get six, and then repeat gank mid lane. Now, what you must focus on here from the Kane's ganking procedures is the pathing is immaculate. The pathing is great. We circumvent possible vision. We use our rule breaking appropriately, but any jungler of any class can gank like this and can farm like this, maybe not with the speed, but there is a reason previous editions of this video included things like Volibear, Warwick, Sejuani, because I wanted to showcase to you, hey, look, this is how you do it on champions that inherently don't have that natural power. But in this video, we're saying, hey, look at what happens when you do the same thing with a cane. So whatever meta champion you have, you can do this stuff. Just focus on what's going on, what fundamentals are being applied. For example, hey, I hit six, I should probably use that ultimate. Comes to mind, maybe a Karthus, a Fiddle, a Hecarim again. What a really good, smooth early game. I love the game planning. I like the ganking pathing. I like the fusion of farming, orb gathering, and obviously getting ourselves some decent CS. And I love the fact that even though someone was taking an objective, we didn't overcorrect for it like a lot of lower ELO players would do. We also set up our sequencing perfectly and use the downtime between taking the Krugs and finishing off with the Grump with great action. Now, obviously when you see a lane that can be held or maybe top lane is actually gankable here, you could do that. But we decide to hold the lane to get the free minions. We fall back to our blue and Grump because obviously that's what we want to do. We see the enemy jungler track them that they're going to go for this Herald. Now don't act like this Mundo here, don't act like this high elo Lilia here. Instead, what you want to do, and those are taken from other content across my ecosystem, instead, if you want to contest this, which, you know, I don't necessarily think you should all the time, 
definitely great to go ahead and try. But at the same time, what makes this unique to Kane is we want some orbs and we want some form. So even if it doesn't go very well, we're going to come out of this getting the form we want. We'll be happy. We'll get blue. We can go ahead and smurf it up. But if we steal it and get all those things, that sounds good, doesn't it? So you are trusting your team to rotate a little bit. Make sure you play off of the give and take. Can you actually go in and steal? Can you actually fight? Is anyone actually paying attention to you? And if not, pull back, finish any camps that you may have on the map, and then of course, go back to base. As always, we will have one or two deaths in these scenarios. Whether they're good or bad is up to you and your decision making. But in this case, I would prefer not to die. You lose a blue, you lose a grump, you lose a herald. It can be a catastrophic ending to your early game. Now, once more, part of the 1v9 is recognizing when you see the game in the balance. Hey, mid lane is fed, top lane is fed. Bot lane is kind of neutral. I'm strong, but you know, I'm not really feeling control in this game. Don't go force an action right now. Do another full clear, control your stuff, get some counter jungling done, hold a wave, and then you can look for a really strong, meaningful gank with your ultimate up. Really looking to use everything to snowball the game in your direction, get a shutdown and so on. This pattern recognition here is very important because it's not unique to Kane. I know a lot of Elises might feel a little bit panicked right now, but you could full clear very quickly and then go for a really good dive. You could still go ahead and repeat gank another situation. Even if your laners seemingly are doing well, you never truly know the gold graph until you look in the post game. So trust your gut a little bit with how it feels looking at how people are performing. And in the end, the whole point of this video is what? Holding waves, ganking and farming fusion, getting your orb fast, impacting lanes, getting yourself fed, counter jungling, objective control, mid to late game control. It's all about you. You have to be the selfish mushroom that's going to take over the fungal field. And even if the Zac or the enemy jungler is getting a few things here and there, that doesn't really matter. Play your game. We can also presume that the Zac is going to want to use his power on the place with the Herald with the winning Ezreal Soraka lane. So in this particular case, if we can get a gank off before he arrives because he shows mid lane, great. If we can get kills and then, you know, push the wave and then maybe do a dragon, great. But the most important thing here as we tie up our early game is to ensure we don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Because in this particular case, you could have a cataclysmically bad play. Give them the plates, give them the turrets, give them your Krugs, the dragon, and now you're looking at a pretty uphill battle. No, instead, you can poke and prod and scan and float and see if something is possible. If there isn't, you can fall back, you can take and shadow. Take your Krug, shadow the situation. Try and stop the Herald if you can. And now to stop autopiloting your decision making at this particular mid-game transition phase, please don't just go and coin flip the dragon steel. Please also don't just totally ignore it if you can in fact contest it. Look at the state of itemization, look at the state of spending, did bot lane go back to base, did Zach go back to base, or do you have all the power? If you have any sort of numbers advantage or potential to take over the situation, please do so. Go into the back line, take out the ADC, take out the Soraka, it doesn't really matter, just remove them from the equation. Even if you don't get the dragon as we don't here, as long as you are making that correct play and that correct read, you still hold the power to be everywhere, to be the MVP, and to be the total carry jungler. If you give up something you don't have to give up, or you try and steal something you should give up, that'll be the equivalent of an economic crash for junglers. And of course, all of us of this generation understand that better than anybody. If real life is doing it to us, why make your jungling? So hopefully you've seen how fast and quick we can make this early game strong. The issue is taking this then and applying it to the mid game. This is where people get a little bit kind of caught up in themselves. They don't really have the impact that they should. They focus on the wrong things and their econ falls off a cliff. Here's how to keep your econ going strong. Firstly, as you've seen here, look for the pick, take your own cams, hold a wave, take the outside end roll by taking that scuttle crab before you take your cams. If you can counter jungle because they're dead or somewhere else, sneak in, sneak out, and fall back to your cams. Now you can reset and obviously you want to focus on the next objective. You want to focus on where your team is. You see Ezra mid lane, you see Zach and Camille top side. Let's go for this fight. Why do I say that so easily? Well, because we're that damn strong. Look at the CS, look at the kills, look at the control we've had over this game. And honestly, that's why I like making this video once per year. You don't always get like a 20 kill bomb, 90% KP, high damage savant game where you were actually behind in gold. But when you do and you hit every single marker correctly, it looks very much like this. Now, obviously we die in this particular case, but that's what we would call a good death. As long as your team is winning the fight, you're dishing out the damage, you're getting the kills, such that they can't take anything away from you, that's okay. We're allowed to have one death in this particular case because the fight was good and the results are good. The next thing here is to, again, not let that econ dip. So as we're leaving the base, we're going for that RNG scuttle. Take the Raptors because they're on your way. If you see someone that you can kill and push off, do so. Otherwise, fall back to your Krugs. Can I now pick someone off as well? Yes, Ezreal, you're out of position. Thank you so much for your life. Go back to base and buy some more stuff. Go to the top side now. Hey, Dragon is spawning. That's okay because I can make a pick on the top laner first. If you cannot make a pick on the top lane of first and you have to get your ass down to dragon, then you know what to do. Go to dragon first. 
Unless, of course, you say maybe have the second Herald, you want to kill the Camille and hide Shelf and give up that next dragon. Problem with that is they already have two. You kind of want this one because if you don't get it, then they're going to have three dragons. They can coin flip a soul for a Baron and you don't really want to play that kind of game. Make sure you get this third one if you're behind in gold and you want a few more strategic options available to you in terms of your macro decisions later on. The whole point is, and I keep saying this lately, do the calculations. If you're a volley bear, you probably can't kill the top laner and get over to the dragon. You would have to make a different play. If you're a Hecarim, yes you can. If you're a Nunu, yes you can. Assess what your champion's capabilities are, determine how much you can do in a given time frame, and then make those rotations. Point being, we attempt to make the pick, which of course we don't overcommit for. If we get it, cool. If we don't, cool as well. We try and shove up mid lane a little bit, but we connect on that fight first and foremost, make the pick, take the dragon, take our cams, we shadow our team who are pushing up the map. We don't go back to base just yet. They're pushing up mid lane, we shadow, and we use the time to take any cams they might have available in that quadrant. Now we can leave. The most important part about this next step for me is, do we actually have Baron control or is the Camille gonna be an issue on the split push? No one's really going for Baron just yet. We need to rotate very quickly to try and push her away from that split pressure she has. Also, we are pathing towards where you wanna be. You wanna shatter your mid lane, obviously, because the Baron is the objective that's on the map, so you wanna go Krugs Raptors towards mid lane, which means we can always have a look for Camille otherwise. If there is nothing happening on the mid lane, then we can go to the walls, grub, and look for a side lane pick, which you should be able to get because everyone in every elo will be over pushing past vision line. Most champions will 100% be able to do something about it. Now you might think this game looks a little bit over, but it really isn't because we still have two very important steps to discuss. First one is if you have that pressure now to do that Baron, go ahead and do it. But if you have any uncertainty about that outcome of that fight, if you have any uncertainty over the macro plays going on, do not coin flip it. Position yourself to turn, position yourself to make picks, because numbers advantage is king. If you have numbers advantage, you have the ability to match bad split push macro. You have the ability to win every team fight because you have more than they do. And obviously you can keep taking all of their stuff. And the first is at this stage, remember what I just said, path towards where you wanna be, but at the same time, we're gonna have to team fight. We're gonna have to make picks. You're the assassin, get into the jungle, look for the flanking angles. As soon as someone steps out, you make the pick, you make the play. You also have to show absolutely immense patience. You cannot afford to go in to aggressively die and throw a situation. Look at this cutaway quickly at a Platinum Emerald Cane that I've coached for a while. He was having not such a good game. In fact, it was a terrible game, but he held his patience as we talked about the whole session for the end play. He just waited and waited and waited until they bunched up, all their cooldowns were down, waited for the Cane combo, everybody whistled away like they were dusted and they reverse pushed from that play and won. So if we go back to our main character's game here, it's the same thing. Look for those picks, be patient about it, win the fights. If there's barons that you can't take, contest and poke a little bit to stop it. Try not to die yourself, will happen, that's okay. As long as you're not dying and then they get the baron and every one of them is alive. Yeah, then you just shouldn't have contested and maybe look for a bit more split pressure and map pressure. Now this does happen a few times and what happens is we just ensure that we're taking these fights over meaningful objects like, you know, dragons, like the potential of a baron. And at the same time, the most important thing we have here is eventually we do get the Baron. After a lot of song and dance and quick highlights, we get it. The K now has already 17 kills. He's trying to drag his team across the finish line. Camila is now split pressuring the map because she knows they can't win these team fights anymore. So what do we do? We don't overreact to her pushing bot lane. And this is the final thing. Understand that pressure release when it comes to the late game. You push that top lane, let Camille push in a little bit. If you're going to trade inhibs, that's fine. If she's going to take an inhib, that's also, you know, not ideal. But what we can do is, of course, force them to defend us a little bit. Go back to base, clean up the Camille. And now because we have Baron, the one pressure point they have on the map is that super minion wave, which we can then just reverse push up. But don't go split pushing yourself just yet. Ensure you are shadowing your team. They will show up. The enemy will show up. They always do. That's when your time to shine arrives once more. Get those kills, and now you go around the world doing general macro, repeating this process times three, four, five times. And no, I'm not explaining it point by point because it really is just a repetitive process at this stage. I will leave a link below to my mid-game macro guide and the macro guide for this, as well as team fighting. So if you want to look more in depth into exactly how you execute this yourselves, you will have all the material at your fingertips. And you can see the gold graph on your screen. This was not a free win. We had to really fight for it. Yes, we had a little bit of fun with the fights and so on, but you got to use your fedness in the correct way. One bad decision equals GG, you lose, 
and you gotta play around your team to a certain degree as well as matching the enemy team's macro pressure. While you would expect a challenger jungler to drop 30 kills when smurfing, what happens when they drop it in a challenger game in Korea and yet he isn't able to win? Now I'm sure all of you are used to trying to 1v9 games, dropping 20 to 30 kills, and you also throw games. So let's just jump on into the first clears here and look at his story about how he got fed, what caused him to lose, so you can learn from it, so when you drop 30 kills, you're guaranteed the win. And trust me, this is a translating principle no matter what jungler you play. So the Karthus starts on the top side and he will sequence down. We have the Kha'Zix doing the Raptors Krogs red into that Wolves Grump blue sequencing, except he notices, wait, I'm really damn slow at clearing. And the Karthus says, hey, I'm done at 257, I'm gonna go back to base. And the Karthus does that because he clears so effectively and quickly, he has no bottom lane prior, so he knows that he has to swap over and go to the top side and get that Scuttle Crab. Kha'Zix then does doesn't decide to finish his blue, he does a scuttle and goes for that gank on the bottom side, the dive, and grabs himself two kills. While you watch him do that, it's important to note that when you're doing a full clear and you're sequencing in a direction, if you see a gank you can react to and you know the enemy jungler isn't going to be around, don't worry about your clear, you can always come back to the buff, finish it off later, you can do the scuttle crab on your way down, don't finish your clear and lose a ganking opportunity when there's no jungle around, purely because you're worried about some sort of clearing tempo. Make that impact. When you play against things like this Karth, as you see, he does a top scuttle, he goes ahead and takes your second spawn Raptors, he shows up in the mid lane there and then shadows to the top side. And when you see the Karth is there with that very heralded 32 CS, you know he did 28 CS full clear back scuttle crab and then took our Raptors for 32. And if you want to understand how to apply these champions and information to your own game, I have a free jungle improvement resource as well as a dedicated program where we have jungle video courses, jungle coaching, coaching VOD libraries that has weekly free video content seen nowhere else as well as Q&As and patch note rundowns as well as a private jungle discord. And if there's one thing I'm good at, it's converting junglers to gold, to emerald, to diamond, to master plus. If you want to climb faster than anyone you know, jungle diff every game you play, click the link below or head to vakayu.gg. While the Karthus could have maybe stolen our second spawn Krugs as well, the Karthus is coming out with a huge base that's a Raider Dirk. He can take his blue, he can shadow down, he can gank mid lane, and then he can loop back into the bottom side jungle. Why? Because we know that the Karthus, when he invaded and stole our raptors, showed mid lane, will go back to his second spawn Grob, second spawn Wolves, and come down to these raptors and Krugs. Now it's all very well being the fast clearing jungler with map control who isn't going to gank as much, but when Kha'Zix hits you with the Scryer's Bloom, you know he's in that area, you know he can kill you, don't path like the Karthus does here, Kha'Zix grabs another kill. Simply loop around the long way, avoid any sort of environment where you could be killed by the Kha'Zix, loop around the turret if you have to, and then take the Krugs by pulling them out. You waste the Kha'Zix's time, your bottom lane can rotate, and this way you don't feed him unnecessarily. But from the Kha'Zix's perspective, this was the best play, it was a great read, he understood what was happening, he knows he cannot farm him, and then he goes mid lane, does grab himself yet another kill, but does a little bit of dying. That's okay, Karthus will hold and shove the wave and try and kill the Vex, Kha'Zix will come out of base straight down the middle, and now again you might think, alright, 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 we're gonna go and do the Krugs, we'll do our Raptors, we'll sequence down again, maybe we can do the Grump on the Wolves and go up and do the Herald, no, my untamed jungle gorillas, look at the bottom wave, you see the dives, you see what's going on, you see the center overcommitting, the Karthus is moving on down for the scuttle to shadow it, Kha'Zix doesn't waste a second. To get 30 kills a game, you will often notice that you get around 14 to 15 in your regular game time and then you just start to snowball many kills later on. But also you have these games where there's a lot of activity and you have to react to it and capitalize. Whether you're farming and ganking, it doesn't really matter if you end up with 20 to 30 kills, this is the process of that. Now this is a fast moving game, this is what happens sometimes. You want to technically go and do your wolves, you want to try to get that level 6 that first evolve as fast as possible, but then you see the Singe moving from the top lane, you see the Karthus trying to steal your top side, you see a collapsible situation, so you go again. And here's where Karthus gives up a little bit of control. He shadows to the top side and then comes back down. The Karthus saw the Kha'Zix going down, yes, which means we think, okay, the Kha'Zix is most likely going to invade our red side. If you're the Karthus, you say, cool, thanks, because now I get the Herald, I get your red side maybe, I at least get my blue side, there's a lot of stuff I can do here getting huge CS leads. And as with all games where you are truly 1v9ing, not only is it you being fueled up with the best nitrous oxide, it's the enemy jungler really running on vegetable oil making mistakes. When both of those are true, you get games like this. And as I always tell you, the best tracking, invades and counter jungling lead you to the best ganks. You've taken the red, you evolve your Q, you steal his raptor, you force him to the top side, Hey, bottom lane are trading without paying attention, as always, snag yourself yet another kill. Okay, so now you're thinking, alright, Kha'Zix is really, really fed, the Karthus is gonna get that Herald cool, I should go bottom side and get the Dragon. This is the thing, many snowballing, scaling, assassin types, even Graves players, you get these leads and then you just take your foot off the pedal enough that the enemy jungler gets to breathe, start to be where you are not, starts to get better econ, maybe impacts another lane, and that's when you kind of lose control. So if you want to win these kinds of games, keep the control. 
That means, yes, you take your buffs when necessary, you go to the camps that are available, you look to shadow mid lane when there's activity. If you see your top lane are deep warding deep inside the enemy jungle and you can get there and get a kill, you do that as well. What good is having this itemization advantage if you're never gonna use it? The most important thing is you would have noticed a lot of kills here. We're down 30 odd CS, we need to convert these kills into objectives. Yes, so we go ahead and take the dragon, we know we got the herald, that's fine. Now when you decide to engage in someone who's in the wrong area while you finish that, you can't really expect the Gwen to teleport and kill you, but unleash teleport 10 minutes, you know it's a possibility, just try to keep your eyes open to it. And once you've cleared your eyes of the tears from your death and your shutdown going to a Gwen, you see the enemy bottom lane being shoved in, the Kyrthus is using the Herald smashing its face on the plates. The only thing more satisfying than seeing a Herald smash into plates is watching Mundo take a turret. So in this case, yes, we go down to our blue Grump, why? Because we need to protect our camps from potential counter jungle and we know how powerful that is in the current meta and how it can deny us hugely. If he has a big sequencing lead, that's great, provided it's not all my camps, I need to still get those while I'm taking all of his teammates' lives. And the only thing you can describe what he does now and after that is Kyrthus goes back to base, so he knows that Karthus is not on the map. We go predator mode, we go hunting. Point your laser, pick out the squishy, kill them. And now we don't fall back to our camps, we parole the river, we go into the jungle, we take his camps in his face. You see how he's consistently looking to get more kills, to shove them back, to keep them on the back foot. They cannot go anywhere without fear that you're gonna jump out of a bush and kill them. But as you will note, when you hit the 40 minute marker, your teammates are moving around the map, turrets are falling, the chess pieces on the board are being positioned. Don't always path away from your team, path towards them. If your team wanna take a turret and siege, you know someone can collapse in them. When you're taking camps and completing quadrants, you wanna ensure that you keep shadowing and positioning such that when a fight breaks out, you're capitalizing, you're getting kills, you're saving your teammates, you are the fed one. Now, again, we die unfortunately, but that's okay. I mean, in general, dying isn't always okay, but in this case, we kill the Akshan as well, and the center got the kill, but you know what, as long as the Akshan is dead, that's great. And as we fully enter the mid game here, this sequence is one of the best you can ever learn in terms of caring from this position. As I said, you don't wanna be farming in the opposite direction towards where your team are or where people are overcommitting. He takes the red, he kills him in the mid lane. Now you go back to camps. No, Karthus is overcommitting on the top side. Run up the river, kill him too. Now we can look back to Krugs, Raptors. They're dead for a while. The death spawn timers go up, so you have more downtime when you kill someone. Use that to get a full sequence econ, all your buffs, and then you go back into the bottom side river. Essentially what this is, you come onto the map, you see if there's something you can do after your buff, you do it. Is there anybody else you can kill very quickly? Great. Are there any objectives for you to snack? No, they're all down. Therefore, now I can farm. You do a quick full sequence while everyone's dead. And then of course, no way to split push or join your team. Here, there's someone over committing so we can kill them and push away for a little bit. But if the wave was just neutral, no one was there, your teammates were out of position, catch the wave and shove it up. If your team were able to win that fight in the mid lane, they can join you for maximum turret taking. But if they of course die, then at least you get the wave pushed up. There's no objective. You don't lose too much as a team. After your pick, we go back to base. Now we're back on the map. Except now we're way more sequenced up with our team and we can go ahead and start a goon squad. Take our team, get into their jungle, deep water it up, and anyone who ventures gets turned into atoms. Or a bloodied carcass of chewed meat if you want to be that kind of predator. And what you're about to witness here is totally 1v9, absolutely astronomically some of the best jungling you're going to see from an assassin in this phase of the game. Hold yourself accountable. If your team are looking to fight, if the enemy team are looking to ball up in death squad, do not get baited in. You, my friends, are an assassin who's hyperfed. You are the carry condition. You are the only one here that's going to do the work. You need to be patient and pick up the pieces as they fall. You need to become more like a hyena. Now, that sounds a little counterintuitive, but you know what I mean, right? All the teams brawl, they lose HP, they lose spells, they're out of position, they're scattering, and then you can just pick them off one by one. So while it can pay to be the predator, it can also pay to be a bit of a hyena in order to pick up the pieces from a good brawl. But not only does he do this mercifully, he also then positions himself to counter jungle their camps, leverages the respawn of his team because nobody else is on the map to quickly snag a Baron. And then now they've all respawned with gold reset. He has no gold reset. So you might be inclined to go back to base and spend, except stay on the map because you know your job as the assassin, as the 1v9 here is to ensure that they never have five set up to actually win the fights. What you do is you then pick people off when they're out of position. You watch your team, you watch the map, you see, can I stay out of clean kills up here? Don't overcommit when you clearly don't have resources, but if you do have the resource, you do have the spells, you do have the flanking angle, utilize it. You would have seen the bullet points there for what to look for in this mid game phase, but this is where most games are won. 40 minute early game savant lead into a mid game domination phase, 22 minutes you have a huge lead and you can never throw. Or if they have wave clear, it takes you another 20 minutes to close, but you never feel out of control. Now for the next few minutes until the next Baron, nothing happens. The blue side team plays it extraordinarily well. They give up all their jungle, they ward, no one gets picked, the Kha'Zix get zero kills, no assists. This is exactly how you should play it if you're the Karthus' team when you're scaling and you know you can still be fed and win. For you, the jungler looking to 1v9 and win, 
This is where you lose and throw because you get impatient. They know they can do this. You start worrying about closing, losing your lead, and so you overcommit on something. Not this Kha'Zix, though he holds true to patience. And yes, while the blue team are able to sneak away this Baron with good positioning, Kha'Zix ensures that one loses the Baron. He ensures his team gets the Dragon. He guarantees as the carry on the team here that when someone's out of position, they die and they lose the Baron slowly. And as he keeps picking off one by one, they lose the Baron, they're able to shove into the base and get an inhib. Well, not quite the inhib, actually. You don't want to free feed the enemy, so that's a good decision to only take the turret. Remember, if you're playing any champion, you can do this. Obviously, the Rengars, the Kha'Zixes, the Kanes, the Karthuses can all do these kinds of things. But so can the Lee Sin, the Jav, and the Hecarim. Any jungler you're playing is able to do this, unless, of course, you're more like the Ivan supportive style junglers. You got your Morganas and your Maokais and, you know, more supportive CC-based kits, your mobile. Then, obviously, you need to play a little bit differently than these other champions. Your positioning has to be more intelligent, but the goal is still the same. Hey, look, they took a Baron. I'm going to clean someone up and do their dragon. You can be anybody for that. Hey, look, now we've taken one off of them. There's two in the top side. I can kill them. You can do that as well. Now, remember, we're hunting 30 kills here and a win. So your deaths are important. You cannot afford one more death at this particular stage. Maybe one, but you have to play it super, super well. So you're doing the same thing. You're pushing side waves. You're in the jungle. You're waiting to make sure that you can get that inhib and maybe the bottom lane inhib. And what he does, and I don't see a lot of junglers do this enough, you watch the fight. You're looking for that hyena moment or the predator moment, and it never arrives. Your team starts to lose tempo there, and there's nothing really you can do. Slide on out and quickly take that inhibitor. Same thing in the early game. Oh no, this is a doom scenario. I'm going to slide on out and take his Krugs quickly as I leave. I'll slide on out and quickly take that scuttle crab. When you can sneak something away in a lost moment, it just gives you a small win when maybe you need one, and that small win could always be useful. Sometimes it's just about stacking enough pennies to make a dollar, and that's all you're trying to do when you win a game of League sometimes. Now, we give up the dragon. Okay, that's fine. No stress. We'll go ahead and take the bear, and that's cool, nice trade, because we obviously don't want an elder situation necessarily. So yeah, the use of the GA to take the inhib was great, and now they're sieging on the top lane. Here's where he makes an absolutely almost game-losing mistake. Not quite game-losing, but it can feel that way. His team cut in front of the enemy's base. They're crossing over to the mid lane here instead of fully on sieging the top lane turret. When now goes aggressively on him, he's forced to reposition burning as more. He had to sell his GA because he doesn't have that active anymore and he'll buy it again later on. And he gets kill hungry. He sees a low Gwen, he sees a low Karthus, and he goes ahead and jumps right on in. But the problem with that is he had to wait for his W. He could not jump into them because of Karthus' death spawn. Auction over the wall, center spacing to the left. He jumped into the middle of four people, died for it. If the whole enemy team is shoved up and you've got supers running down mid lane with a Baron, you can push those towards the Nexus turrets, and now you can decide, look, do I need to go hit those and end the game, or can I float back in with my W of cooldown and use that to kill the Karthus? The kill hunger cost him his life and a lot of temper. But again, not the reason that he's going to lose this game. It happens right here. He respawns, he has GA again, and now he is a little bit tilted. The game has gone on a long time. They still have total control. They can still win it very easily. The inhibitors respawned though. Their side wave and mid wave control is not great. His Rel is coming out of base. The Callist is in the mid lane. Singe is on the bottom side and he's going with Vax to go and try and kill a Gwen. It takes everything. They do it. Karthus is R though. And Akshan will chase him down and finish him off. And that, my friends, is sometimes all that happens that can cost you a game. He went way too far, way too deep without paying attention to the map the first time. Most of you do this, and you do this in all your games, when you have 10 kills, 8 kills, 5 kills, you think, hey look, someone's splitting, I can go kill them. You don't look at your waves, you don't look at the state of the game, and it costs you. Lazy base as well. Now the enemy team gets to take another dragon, shove down an inhib, and even though he tried his best to win the next fight with his lead and slipperiness, he just couldn't do it. I cannot tell you how many times I see junglers get these leads and not do these steps properly. If you copy this guy in the early game and the mid game, you most likely will win at least 80% of those games provided you understand what went wrong here in the late game. Yes, it was drawn out. Yes, it was about team fighting mechanics and understanding when to push and pull with macro. But at the end of the day, as a jungler, it's about executing early and mid, controlling your leads, denying the enemy jungler, and then playing towards whatever win condition you have. And if you don't want to be a high level jungler getting 30 kills and losing in Challenger, maybe pick an easier jungle to help you execute your vision. So let's start off with our main gameplay example. We will also have a secondary gameplay example where I will show you how I use this tip, as well as one where I coached it to someone else in Platinum and Gold, and he smurfed all over someone's ass. So we watch a Briar do the Raptor's Red Krug standard stuff. If there's nothing on the bottom side, you can go back to base by Doran's Blade. You can also just stay out and carry on your sequencing. And I'm simply going to describe the events of this game, analyze what's going on. But when the moment comes where the Graves does not do what he should do, that's when he loses the game. No matter what game stage you're in, if you recognize it, it can swing you wins no matter what. 
So we have the Briar going to the top side trying to kill of course the enemy Darius who's already shoving. The Graves decides to react and go for some sort of cheese invade off the blue side. Briar has to respect this a little bit, Graves decides to cross mid lane, snag himself up some experience from there and head to the bottom side scuttle. Even Briar isn't necessarily going to be one of these AFK farming champions and she likes fisting, ganking, fighting, skirmishing, invading. She decides to cross over the mid lane and protect her bottom side from the Graves' pressure because we know he's on that side. He started with Red Krug's Raptors, he shows up on the top side, he floats down to the bottom side. We know that he has wolves available much like we have Grump available because we skipped it. And the first big sin of this patch of the new meta of jungle since the changes is staying out way too long and the Graves does it right here. He sequences all the way back up to the top side again, tries to get a gank off on the top laner, but the enemy mid laner, the Nico, she is 6, the Briar has gone back to base and now has a serrated Dirk and she shows up on the top wave as well. This is why you don't stay out longer than you need to because the camps that are going to respawn at level 5, they are going to have a lot more HP, they're going to be harder to take and you don't want to waste time taking longer to take camps when you could, you know, not take that much time. It's better to reset, come up with Dirks and Dorian's Blades and try a good old fashioned item spike advantage. Except in this case he doesn't have it. He ends up dying and here's where things get really really interesting. The Graves is going to respawn and go for his red. There's an RNG Scuttle spawning on the top side as well. Briar's going to want to use her economical advantage and itemization to try and get other lanes ahead. The Nico's obviously doing well, the top laner's not doing well, the ADC is doing well, so we want to snowball that. The Graves ends up sequencing down to his blue side quadrant. And while he does it, you can watch the Briar get kills, clean up kills. She's getting really, really fed from this. There's not much the Graves could have done. Now the Briar falls back to her red, of course, and the Graves decides to float on back down to the river. He had shown to Shadow just a little bit and, you know, see if he could pick something up, but there's really nothing he could have done. Simple watching the Briar and understanding she didn't have red would have told him, hey, she's gonna go back to her red. He's still here, loitering, what is he gonna do, the dragon, is he gonna gank the lane, can he gank mid lane? No, none of these things. In the end, he's out of position, gets collapsed upon, and killed. Now, what he should have done here is, instead of going to his red, he knew the Briar was going back to base after the kills on the top side. Even if she steals a red, who cares? That's not good timing for her. He should go down to his Grump. His wolves are going to be respawning. His bottom lane's already losing. He knows he cannot fight the Briar. The Briar's going to most likely go to the bottom side here for her red spawn. Let me take my Gromp, take my wolves, go for my red. And if I see the Briar show bottom lane here, I can cut at any point to take that Skeletal Crab and I can counter jungle her a whole blue side and then fall back to the Herald. Your blue camps are defended from potential counter jungling. You get an objective, you counter jungle her twice, you get your red and you have free real estate to impact top lane or mid lane as necessary as the map dictates. That my friends is exactly how you wrestle control in negative game states in weird game states where you cannot match the enemy jungler's fisting, fighting and gold lead. You will get it back through counter jungling and remember because the camps have more HP now when they respawn at higher levels because you took them, a jungler who's behind on gold or equal and behind on experience will take a lot longer to clear them. This gives you a temper advantage in whatever the hell you want to do, whether it's more counter jungling on the other side, objectives or ganking lanes. This complete oversight from the graves will cost him this entire game. Now Briar gets the objective from his death, that's great kill conversion ratio, when you get kills, can I take an objective, push a turret, that's your first inclination. He gets interrupted and says, hey you know what, I could stay for a few more kills, which of course she does. And as you watch her go for some more kills, the Grave says, hey I can go topside and get an objective. This feels amazing, except now I can't counter jungle on the blue side. Briar pings on the map thinking he could be doing it, but obviously he won't because he'll lose that PvP. He's forced to now go to the bottom side, but he didn't counter jungle her. Now he does end up in the right position where he can take his blue side camps, dive bottom lane with the Herald while Briar's on the top side diving top lane, but she has a global ultimate that she can hit and rotate on. So as you're doing this stuff, pay attention to the fact that that's a possibility. Nocturnes, Karthuses, Shens, all of these things have to factor into your game planning when you make these decisions. But also, if you're this far behind the ganking numbers, you cannot be this far behind in CSing numbers. If you're getting cheese or have a ganking jungler against you, there's a certain way to play to ensure that they are absolutely miserable. You beat them 1v1 at a certain point for your first kill, and your laners are going to play around you because they realize that you're actually smurfing on them. Now you understand a little bit about how counter jungling can be used in weird games and games where you're just behind, but you didn't quite see the raw power that it has. So let me show you. Cue the second game. The Zyra starts on her red buff, knows that it was warded on her blue buff, which she also warded. We also know that the Lee Sin is going to think about invading. Any jungler that might think about invading, it's always good to reverse clear a little bit. So you go to your blue, you start it up, you pull it out into the bush, Lee Sin shows up, you outsmite him. You're level 2, he's level 2, you go at it. You know now that he feels like he's screwed, so he's gonna go to the Grom, so you use the plant to bait him around the wall. You chunk him a little bit more and you win the HP war. The HP war is a term I've been using recently, where you can use it early game around dragon fights, baron fights, split pushing, poking, it doesn't matter. 
If you're able to compromise an enemy's HP where they have to back out of a fight or go back to base, that is equally as good as getting a kill in a lot of cases. Not always, but it is just as good if it gets you what you wanted in the first place. In this case, Grump. Now you know that Lee Sin did his red into this invade, probably either goes back to base to the blue side or stays out and does raptors into the blue side. So what we do is you do your wolves, and instead of doing raptors krugs like a defenseless chicken, you know you have a bit of an HP war advantage. So, you go to the bottom scuttle crab, there's Lee Sin, doesn't think you're gonna show up, smites it, so you snack it away. Now take that W and please leave, don't greed for kills and die, that is a big no-no, obviously a big throw moment, but... Let me show you what this means overall. You know the Lee Sin still has his blue and still has his grump, and your bottom lane do get fed from the play, which is okay. So we know that when he respawns, he's gonna deal with those bottom side camps, because two camps are greater than one camp, which is the crook camp. Obviously that hasn't taken. So, as the Zyra in this particular case, ignore your tier 1 raptors and Krugs. He will assume you're going to do the same thing, right? Two camps better than zero. Except you understand that counter jungling is the way to play the game right now to get huge, huge leads. You know the tier 1 Krugs are up, so you go ahead and take this. Nidlis, Greys, Rengars, Kindreds, doesn't matter who you are, you can do this. And because you kind of have a loose idea of when those Raptors are going to respawn, given when he invaded and when you saw him next, he had 12 CS. He also didn't have his blue buff, so you knew he did Red, Raptors, Wolves, and therefore you can kind of guess a time. So you take the Krugs, and then you're right on time for the respawn of the Raptors. Now it's fair to assume that the Leeson thinks you're pathing to the top side, so he might go for a gank in the bottom lane assuming there's no chems. And this is what it comes to as well. You also need to punish their mistakes, and very, very quickly. If they show, if they die, if they miss an objective, you need to harness that opportunity as quickly as possible, because when you do, the ability to come back is so dwindled, is so much more difficult that they really have no other choice other than to accept the L and hope their team can carry them. So Leeson hangs around bottom lane, he gets kills, he doesn't get kills. Like in the Graves example, if the Briar gets kills, she gets kills, nothing you can do about it. You just control your own econ. A full sequence down here and staying out is a really good idea because if you reset, you might lose some Raptors and Crooks, so control those camps. The reason is they're all level 1, so we want to take them off the map most importantly, but because the Leeson has spent time in the bottom lane creating some prior for his bottom lane to roam, you know they might look to do a red buff invade. Obviously, you're a smart cookie, so you know this might happen, so you planned accordingly, and again, because you have the advantage, you can leverage that, experience, gold, whatever it is, to win the HP war. You chunk them, they're compromised, they're down a level, you get a free red buff, how nice. It is important to try and have impact on lane, so if you see bottom lane where you can rotate, do so. If your bottom lane takes care of business and all you need to do is shove them out to protect them from Lee Sin, also do that. You kind of want to do the crab, but you know Lee Sin most likely took it. Zed confirms with a ward. Okay, so this is not so bad, right? 55 CS to 24 CS. Fortunately, he hasn't gotten kills, but his mid laner is kind of fed. Now it's time for the Bane backbreaking move. Did you notice on the small screen when he decided to fall back to his Grump here, how long it took him to do it? This is where things get a little weird, because even as a Zyra here, you would assume he's back and doing stuff on the top side, yes? You would assume at this point you kind of want to do blue Grump Wolves, maybe loop into the Herald casually. But because he takes so damn long on the Grump, he shows a bottom lane again without having based again. Do not wait a second. You have two choices. You do the Herald and you accept the fact that he did the dragon and you get this. I think that's okay. You can also go for the red side quadrant counter jungling again and then fall back to the Herald. The problem is if your champion, even well ahead, can get run over by a strong mid and jungle and maybe there's a Scion who wants to run into you as well, inting his way to victory, that's just not really the fight you want for the Herald. So take the free Herald because he's still down there and he dies again. Go ahead and take all of his camps. Remember, death respawn timers have gone down, so deaths aren't really as bad as they used to be. Yeah, they're still gray screen, but they're up on the field a lot sooner, so you don't have as much time to do stuff. But the point is, you've got a ganking jungler staying on the same side of the map, much like the Briar did. The difference is the Lee Sin isn't getting anything, but even if he was, you have to make sure you have that experience and gold parity and deny him from getting anything extra from those kills, because it's still going to take them a lot longer to clear those camps when they do respawn at a higher level. So, you take the Raptors, you take the right, you take the Krugs. And even though he's got that one cheeky assist, he decides to go and coin flip for the Scuttle Crab because he lost his whole red side quadrant a second time. The thing is, my friend, it's 79 to 28 CS. It is a huge experience advantage of two levels, and you have everything up. So, you make sure you stay close to him, so when he flashes, he gets knocked up and you kill him. Then you take the Scuttle Crab. And now he is unholy compromised. You know he's going to have to go to the bottom side of the map. You're going to the bottom side of the map, and now you can start to match things up and use your power over him. And when it's something like a 91 CS to 32 CS lead, what exactly are they going to do to you at all? And yes, that means, hey, he's going to take the second dragon, but you got some cleanup kills, you control your quadrants, you're protecting your camps. You should never be giving up this control. You should always be able to rotate and use the gold advantage and experience advantage and your build advantage 
to kill him if he tries to do something, to kill laners if they try to do something, and the game should be won pretty easily through standard jungle macro play. That is linked below if you want a bit more information about that, but this just showcases two examples. When you don't count a jungle, what it means for a ganking jungler who has success. When you do count a jungle, what it doesn't mean for them because you still have the lead. And now, what if you have an early invade, you're in a platinum MMR game, so this applies to everyone in mid and low elos, and you invade and kill a puppy. Now you fall back to the scuttle crab, you take it. Cool, right? But where's the puppy going? Think. Most likely, she's going to the bottom side, but no camps will have respawned. She'll take the scuttle crab. Ah, but she knows that your krugs are respawned, so she's gonna go ahead and take them. And if you have a problem, you've now been counter jungled. And I think what we've seen in this video is if someone makes a mistake, they spam gank, they die. If you counter jungle them and take objectives, you are absolutely screwing them for the game. It is hilarious how long it takes them to do camps. They can never catch up, and it's all on you to apply that pressure continuously. So, don't do your blue side quadrant on the top side. That will still be there. Go back to base. Prevent them from taking your Krugs, take your Raptors, you know they're now going to sequence to the top side again, and you kind of want to go and get in their face and take the Raptors and Krugs, right? But they're there, and they have mid lane prior. So, let them have the Raptors, but take the Krugs. This was a Platinum level pathing from someone I've long term coached, using the courses and so on, and you can see how their pathing has evolved into very quick decision making. It's allowed them to climb, I've made a video on them, but I'm just showcasing to you in this particular meta, when you counter jungle and punish mistakes, you understand quick thinking, and you know when to give up a quadrant to defend your other quadrants that might be counter jungled, those level 1 camps will be quickly taken, and now no one can do anything to you. It's all about understanding this, and this alone, that makes the difference between those junglers who are going to smurf and climb from here on out, as this is the new reality of jungle, and those who simply will not. You ever wonder why Korean junglers risk it all on invades, scuttle crabs, and dragon fights? These moves might look like a coin flip, but behind them is the Korean jungle secret that allows them to be some of the best in the world. And in this video, I'm going to help you understand that secret, which will of course 10 times your jungle ability. So first, we're going to do this challenger game, Jax vs Graves, an understatement of the century when we we will say Graves is significantly better as a jungler. And then we're going to look at a real example, which will be more representative of your own MMRs. And the reason for all of this, all of the things that they do is to try and get that time advantage. And when you have that, how you use it is very, very important. I mean, obviously it's important. Otherwise, I wouldn't show Jack starting Raptors misleading like he's going to the blue side, then actually going to the Krug's red. This directs the Graves to think, hey, I can't invade the blue side because Jax is there. And this is where we are really going to be talking about this Korean trick, this principle. And as the Jax crosses from his red side camps to his blue side camps at about 243, very, very slow. Typically, in most junglers, you want to be in the mid to low 2 minute 20s. He basically would normally just finish his full clear, hopefully not get invaded. The Graves is prior for the gank bottom lane and the scuttle. You can just go back to base right and then head straight to the top side scuttle. The Korean secret here is to always try and maintain a time advantage, a tempo advantage, to go and gain things and also cut off what the enemy jungler wants to accomplish, which is exactly what you saw. He did the Grom, goes to the bottom lane for the gank, Grace finishes his full clear almost, is forced to rotate over to it because of the actions that doesn't finish his Krug camp. They stay fisting a little bit, the Graves goes in a little too deep and gets W'd by the Jax. It says thank you very much or spank you very much with my line post. And then now of course he can go to the bottom side scuttle. And this reigning secret principle is the fundamental behind all of the aggression that you see. The high risk maneuvers that you see are because they know they can mechanically pull them off, but that the payoff is so damn big that you can most likely snowball an end for most of these scenarios. If you want help implementing this information into your own game, I have a free jungle jungle improvement resource as well as a dedicated program where we have jungle video courses, jungle coaching, coaching VOD libraries, weekly free video content seen nowhere else as well as Q&As and patch note rundowns as well as a private jungle discord. And if there's one thing I'm good at it's converting junglers to gold, to emerald, to diamond, to master plus. If you want to climb faster than anyone you know, jungle diff every game you play, click the link below or head to vakayu.gg. However, it's not a one and done thing yes, it's a tug of war the whole time with two equally skilled junglers. Again, I'll show you in another example that's more realistic to you, but the Graves basically knows, hey, the Jax could easily do the Scuttle, the Blue, and the Wolves, and that could leave me the ability to take his Raptors that he started on, and then his Krugs if he wants to invest that much time in the bottom side. And so as you see, what Jax does is shadows the mid lane gank that the Graves does to get himself a kill, and now can take away his Raptors and Krugs from the Graves. So you take away what he wanted to do, which is most likely Scuttle into, of course, the counter jungling. The alternative for the Graves is, hey, look, I can gank mid, I can take the Scuttle, I can gank top lane, I don't need your camps. So the Jax makes a play just in case the Graves wants to take those things. The Graves takes other things, but the misdirect is still important. The Graves will now go down to his Gromp and his Wolves, yes. The Jax will obviously reset and go back down to the blue side quadrant. Worth noting, he already had a blue from killing the Graves, so it's not like he needed his own. The Graves will now be sequencing to the bottom side, and the Jax can basically say, hey, look, 
I've swapped my directional pathing, you think I'm probably sequencing down and I'm behind you. In reality, I'm ahead of you because I thought about what you wanted, I took it away, you got other things instead, now I can get ahead of you on the bottom side. And of course, if there's no gank and your bottom lane are killing each other and there's nothing you can do, you can do your blue side quadrant. Can I gank mid lane? No, okay, I can't counter jungle because Graves is most likely there, so I'll just do the dragon and take the random scuttle crab. I can go ahead and have a look for gank mid lane. But while he's doing that, what do you think that Graves was doing? That's right, the Grave sequences down, sees the same things that Jax does, sees he doesn't have prior to go for the crab or the dragon, and says, look, if you've just not taken the dragon, then I know your topside camp should be available, so while you kind of do that reset path up to the top side, I'm gonna go ahead and take your third respawn raptors, your third respawn krugs away from you, thereby creating a time gap between him and Jax. He's on the raptors while Jax is somewhere else, and the Jax is not trailing him, while the Graves takes away his camps, and now the Jax has lost things, and the Graves has cut in front of the Jax and prevented what he wanted to do next. So when you're tracking and playing in the game and you're always trying to understand exactly what you should be doing, think about the enemy jungler. What are they going to want to do next? Could I maybe counter jungle the camps or should I go somewhere else to prevent them doing what they want to do? You always have to decide from your PvP nature what the map looks like, which is the best decision. In this case, the Grave said, look, no lane prior. I don't want to go fight 3v1. I'll just take away the camps from somewhere else. The Jax is going to arrive and be like, oh shit, he took my stuff. That's because the Graves knew once he's done with the dragon and everything, he's going to want to reset or do something about the topside camp, so I'll just take those away from you because I knew you wanted to do them, so I said no. And sometimes this leads to Viegos and Talia's fisting it out on a raptor camp for the same reason, because sometimes junglers do different things than you expect, but a mage unloading her damage spells and then if nothing else is no match for, you know, a male shirtless fighting champion that Riot seems to so lovingly make and overture them to some degree or at least make them super strong in fights, you know, so there you go, free kill for the Viego, but as you can see, sometimes it ends up in a PvP thing and sometimes it's just a case of I stole stuff that you wanted. And as you would have seen, the Jax said, hey, I got nothing else to do, might as well gank the top side, take the Herald, go back to base. Graves just did a full sequence down, there's a little bit of a fisting thing that goes on here, a ganking skirmish that happens. Graves, of course, gets himself fed, but the Jax does the most important thing in these situations. When you are losing out on this time thing, on this being cut off from doing what you want to do thing, the most important thing is try and take the ganks you can get, control your jungle as best you can, sneak the objectives when you can get them, and if you've got the Herald, be darn well hecking sure that you get at least a few turret plates. And that way you know that you'll have enough gold to go and fuck some shit up. Which is always what happens, because this is the mind game of jungling. Yes, back and forth, taking away things, making plays yourself, preventing the enemy jungler from doing anything, but most importantly, objectives, laner impact, and gold, so that when 40 minutes comes, as it does here, you're at least decently fed, you've got objective control, and you can kind of snowball into that mid game. And of course, the denial thing doesn't stop, right? You know, it's about pushing waves and invading and goon squatting and preventing buffs to be stolen. But it's also you can get to that big old fashioned fight where you just ruffle stump them with your champion. Hopefully you have the mechanics to do so. But how does this work in a slightly separate scenario where maybe you can farm first, unlike the Jacks, and you're against something that can farm even faster than you rotate to everything like a Hecarim. So we've obviously seen in pro play and obviously in high elo, people like to start an enemy's buffs. But what they don't do properly is actually understand this time advantage. So I'm going to show you what that means here. The Zyra does a late invade with her team. Nothing's afoot. And of course, the guy with feet is on the bottom side, not protecting his entrances. Again, this does happen in high elo. Happens in all your elos, obviously. Why would you not maybe do the red raptors krugs here? Because what happens if you do red raptors krugs as a jungler and the enemy jungler beats you 1v1 and is a first to clear it? That's right, you lose the time advantage because by the time you've done all of that, he's in the same vicinity as you and now you can gank the sideline, sure, but he'll rotate and kill you. And if you gank the sideline and go to your blue buff, he will rotate and kill you. Maybe, you know, take your camps as well. So that's not very good. The invade here wouldn't suit us. So we go red, Krugs, goes straight to the blue grub. The ward shows the Hecarim showing up to do raptors. So you give him the raptors as a trade. You say, look, sir, here is your scamp, your starter. All the while you've stolen the main cause. When he gets to the red, he's gonna think, ah, oh, my red is stolen, that's weird. My Krugs are surely, wait a second. But by the time that happens, you're on your wolves, already pathing to the bottom side quadrant. Now, if you're the Zyra, think about what the Hecarim's gonna do here. Most likely try and gank top lane. If that's not gankable, he's gonna maybe investigate your jungle or he's gonna go straight to the mid lane for a gank. If he thinks you started on the top side, you should be on your red side right now. So of course he's gonna try and invade your raptors, or maybe invade your red and steal it away from you. And again, try and kill you. So the importance here is creating that gap, the time advantage that I've been talking about, the Korean secret. If you've got 30 seconds over them, you can be 30 seconds ahead in all pathing games. You finish the raptors, he sees them, and now he's thinking, wait, did she go my red raptors into her red Krugs raptors, or what's going on here? He doesn't exactly know where you are at all, but if you're in control, because you have, again, the time advantage, what can Hecarim do next if the second spawn of his Grumba is going to be at like 4 minutes 20, 
and it's 3 minutes 30. Well, you can go ahead and do your red. You know, he's most likely going to do the Scuttle Crab, and then afterwards, probably look to gank bottom lane. Maybe he thinks your Krugs are available, because how could you invade and take everything, right? That makes no sense. And so what you can do is take your Krugs and set up a beautiful gank when he decides to go here, because he has nothing else to do, right? He cleared his camps, he lost two, you had a 30 second advantage because you skipped the Raptors and baited him with them, that time waste, and of course, now he dies. Now, if you happen to be watching this video and then you go have a game like this and you're the Hecarim and this happens to you, Think about what we're talking about here. Time advantage, right? Tempo control, time advantage, denying what the enemy jungler wants to do. So you know when you respawn, because you respawn ahead of when the Zyra bases, you could have very easily gone to the top side and taken that Scuttle Crab. Could have very easily maybe looked for a top lane or mid lane gank, but ideally top lane, so you could then go to your Krux, because at this point, you know your Krugs have respawned. And at this point, you know exactly when your Raptors are going to respawn, which is of course going to be that five minute-ish marker. If you know the Zyra is going to want to go to the top side and take that Scuttle, maybe repeat take those Krugs or gank top lane or whatever, then if we take the top side Scuttle, gank top lane, take Krugs, the only thing that's going to be available is of course going to be the Raptors, for which you have Pryo and the ability to just kill a simple mage running around in your jungle for no reason. So the Zyra or whatever farming your mobile jungler you play, whether it's a Fiddle, Karthus, Brand, this is all exactly the same principle by the way, you would be a little bit screwed because your respawn of your second Gromp and your second Wolves, that's delayed due to the invade. So if as a Zyra you assume this is a possibility for what he should do, you know that if he doesn't do that, the payoff for you will be pretty big. Let me show you. You go ahead and you look at the Scuttle Crab and you say, cool, that's free, thank you so much, not using the outside rule to take the thing furthest away from you while I'm not on the map. That's exactly what I wanted. Top lane is taking care of itself, so I better just go ahead and do my full sequence down. At this point, it's not worth investigating anymore because you know categorically with this crab being up, the Hecarim 99% is doing the grump and sequencing to the top side. So by the time I've sequenced from here to the bottom side, you will be in a position to gank before him because in order for him to come down here, he has to once more reset suboptimally and walk all the way down with his 18 feet. And you have the level 6 spike, so use it on the Summon Lilith ADC, make sure you get that kill. Obviously, the Twisted Fate is ultimate, Hecarim's gonna be in the area, so now you're kind of forcing a fight here. This is a bit more Korean in nature as well, you're kind of forcing the issue a little bit. You should probably decide if you want to or want not to. But if you get 2 for 1, as most junglers here, like Akarthus or whatever, and even as Iron a Brand, this is good for you, right? This is a lead you can use. And much like the Graves example before, you know the Hecarim then uses that to get a dragon. Do we really care about that? No. So let's take away a gank that the Hecarim could want to get. Top lane. We'll go ahead and gank top lane and snack some plates as well. Then what you're going to do is because you know the Hecarim is going to look to sequence up again, that's what he's shown to do the whole game, and you don't really want to go and coin with the Herald now while Varus is going back to base, you then go and do your blue and your grump. You know there's a distinct possibility that the Hecarim is going to want to sequence up here, knows you gank top lane, will assume you've gone to the bottom side, so you finish off the wolves as well, and then you sit in the bush and you wait for the Hecarim to be baited into this because you've pinged it off, your Varus is back in lane, and you can just observe. The Hecarim thought, hey, the Zyra's somewhere else. The Zyra said, no, I was just baiting you into it using the time advantage I had. And now, sir, you are dead. I have the Herald and I could use it for play cash monies. All by asking, what's the Hecarim going to want to do, based upon what he thinks I'm doing, and then I can just get ahead of him, cut him off, and obviously try and create a time advantage so I have the invest available to use when I need to. And as it goes without saying, don't go and fight a Scuttle Crab or try and take a Scuttle Crab in the name of time advantage, because now you're going to die, collapse, and then they can counter juggle you and get it back. So that is a boo-boo that you don't want to do-do, and instead you should say, okay, look, the Hecarim's going to come to the bottom Scuttle, he's got bottom prior, I should take away my camps and reset because, of course, I have enough gold now and I know he will want to counter jungle them. Let's just protect myself. But as you can see, the Hecarim doesn't know the Korean secret about using slightly higher risk plays in order to create time and tempo advantage in order to prevent the enemy jungle doing what they want to do. And so those camps remain free. And so you can take them, set up another trap, but he has an unstoppable button. A long drawn out fight occurs and at least you get a kill and can shove mid lane a little bit. And now you're straight into the mid game. And of course, keep doing your mid lane principles. Don't let this distract you from the fact that the Hecarim ends up going to the bottom side with Baron up. You snack that up and basically the free win is presenting itself, but you've prevented the Hecarim from doing anything. Slowed his econ down, kept your econ very, very high. So when you see these Korean junglers try these random coin flip invades and these random scuttle fights and things like that, they're just trying to create this time advantage because if you can do that with golden experience leads, then like the Viego vs. example, you can kill them when you try and make these plays. You're not sort of having to run away from them much like the Jax was. He had to wait and be patient, like the Zyra did, had to wait and be patient. But then the Graves case, he knew exactly how to counter that and get himself fed. Sure, they lost the game, but he did his job early, whereas the Hecarim did not do that whatsoever, and then so got severely punished. Always ask yourself what the enemy jungler wants to do, decide whether you want to handshake trade or if you just want to prevent them from doing it. This is a strong-willed principle that will lead to PvP moments, you have to be mechanically good enough, you have to understand gold and item spikes and tempo as well, 
You're always trying to create that lead, and I think the Zyra example showed that, giving the Raptors to create a buffer so that he could get nothing else, and then setting up the counter gank, and this works for lane ganks and so on as well. You've all had games where your bottom lane gets dove over and over again and feeds. You think you can counter jungle, but the enemy support shows up to cut you off. You lose your bottom side camps, you lose dragons, so how can you still 1v9 these kinds of games, keep yourself equal to the enemy jungler, and use every trick you know in order to be the superior jungle difference to climb your way to your chosen peak? And as I'm sure you're aware, and this happens in your games too, your ADC and bottom lane get caught out from a level 1, Italy gets first blood, your bottom lane's behind, and now you're thinking, great, I'm gonna lose my bottom side quadrant as well. Well, the thing is 1v9 isn't always an easy job and a lot of the time it takes a bit of patience. You need to see a few moves ahead. So we start our blue, do our grump, do our wolves. We're not entirely sure exactly what the Nidalee is doing, but you know their bottom lane was late to show, so probably she got leashed on the blue buff. And at least we have a ward on our raptors to see that. The Yone will obviously try and abuse some prior and get a ward down by our raptors too. Nidalee pops right up and now you know your decision is set in stone. Because the Oriana's ward shows her raptors are still available, you know Nidalee's gonna go ahead and do your red side. She shows on that ward with 12 CS and a blue buff. Basically what we're doing here is we're totally gonna give up half of the pizza. I know you wanna eat the whole pizza, I wanna eat the whole pizza, but the problem is the enemy jungler is taking your half. So what we're gonna do is eat all of their dessert. Or you could just make a new pizza, depends if you like dessert or pizza more. I don't know, I kinda go for both. But the one thing we damn well know is the Nidalee's gonna try and dive the bottom lane or gank mid lane, she will have impact in those lanes. So we do our raptors into the red. This is where things need to be very important and drilled into your mind. If you know straight away that, hey, look, I'm going to do the Krugs here, but I need a gank because Nidalee's getting fed in gold experience. My laners are dying. I have to offset this somehow. Keep your eyes on top lane, rotate when top lane needs you, and get the kill when top lane needs you to get the kill. Don't do Krugs. Watch them die and go, guys, you couldn't wait for me. Leave your camps, rotate, get the kill. This has been a biggest thing that I wrote about in the weekly email the other day. It's also the biggest thing that's helped my own game in the last two, three weeks is sometimes even I get stuck full clearing, farming, quadrant clearing, and it's very easy to develop a bad habit of not rotating to things where you can guaranteed get kills. So you killed the Gwen, you became the Gwen, you took the Krugs, you take the top scuttle, you know Nidalee's gonna go back down and finish off your Raptor camp and then do the bottom side scuttle. If you can gank mid lane after the crab and get a kill here like we do, perfect, excellent. You know the Orianna can use that lead herself. You know that the Nidalee just killed her, so it offsets that to a degree. When you reset, here's where it becomes difficult. How you offset vertical jungling is usually because they late invade you and you can just take the camps when they respawn. When you do your own camps and then theirs, you really distort the respawn and now it's quite difficult for you to go to the bottom side. You're not gonna have those Krugs respawn and those Raptors respawn together because the Nidalee took them out of order. So yes, Nidalee's gonna come out of base, do a Grump Wolves and carry on ganking bottom lane. You're gonna go to the top side, take your Grump, Look top lane and say, you know what, I'm going to rotate to the scenario. And again, this is one of these places where you rotate after a camp instead of doing wolves. The enemy top laner pushes in and actually ends up dying. You get nothing, but it's very important that you made this maneuver. You might get something, but also it's really good that the Gwen doesn't get something. Your Renekton is able to snowball. Now you might think, okay, eyes up, I can go back to my wolves, right? At least I tried to make a good play. No, look mid lane. Can I do anything mid lane? If you cannot, go and take her raptors. You know you want to take those raptors into the Krugs. You know the Nidalee's gonna be on the bottom side controlling those cams, but fortunately there is something we can do mid lane. So we're gonna go ahead and gank this Yone. Why? Because the pre-6 gank is huge. You know that between 5.30 and 6 minutes, those solo laners are getting level 6. The Yones, the Shens, the Malphites, anyone with a powerful ultimate, you want to punish them before that comes up, burn summoners and deny them. Now because Nidalee showed on the bottom side, and again, she did red Krugs and ganked mid lane, and then did your Raptors, so the Raptors are respawning very far away from the Krugs, you know, the Raptors are still up, so you go and try and take those. Fortunately, you get it. If you don't get it, you don't get it. The point is, you can go up to your Wolves and finally take that. Here's the question. Does Nidalee now leave your red side quadrant and go to hers? Or does she repeat gank bottom lane? I think we all know where this is going, and she continues to gank the bottom lane. Fortunately for you, that means you can now go ahead and steal her Raptors. Yone rotates, Nidalee rotates, and they kill the Bard on your team, wandering around for his deets and dudes. and basically at this point you're thinking, well... This isn't going so well for most of my team, but for me and Renekton, this is okay. And as you go take the Raptors, if an enemy supporter mid laner shows up trying to prevent you doing it, take what you can, smite what you can, and then obviously use that great angle of approach that I always tell you to gank the lane. Counter jungling leads to great ganks. Now remember, in the context of 1v9 jungling, when the enemy jungler is also getting fed, as long as you are handshaking their actions, by that I mean if they take your stuff, you take their stuff, if they take a dragon, you take a herald, as long as they gank bottom lane and you're ganking top lane, as long as the golden experience is matching up, you can wait for that right moment to really take over games, and I think that big patience 
is what separates your goon junglers from your jungle div savant. We're not too concerned with the Nidla at this point. You know she's going to gank bottom lane. You know she's taking your bottom side camps, your bottom side camps. You know she's going to go for the dragon. So you take the more important thing. That's the Herald. We don't really care about these nerfed and reduced base level dragons. We care about getting the Herald because the Herald is the thing that's going to allow you to propel your gold income way higher and potentially force a big, big fight. So while the Yone has been killed solo by the Oriana a few times, he still got a kill in the Bard. He's still a Yone who can be useful. And you know with the Oriana's push presence now, Rangeless Melee, that there has to be some sort of Roman impact fight here. There has to be. It is developing. You know they're not going to allow you to control two lanes while she's only controlling one. But the thing is, what you have to know is that enemy laners who get in bad situations the higher elo you go, they understand that they can't beat the Renekton or the laner 1v1. So what are they going to do? Leave the damn lane. They rotate over. Gwen's there. Pike is there. Everyone is there. You get collapsed. Punch her, you get a kill, but you also die and give a shutdown away. So unfortunately, this didn't work out the way we wanted, but the idea was good. Use the Herald, get gold, force a fight, win the fight, win the game. Now though, we're on the back foot yet again. So can we correct the vertical jungling we've had all game? How do you actually shut down the enemy jungler, the enemy Nidalee, in this particular instance? Well, considering you don't have timers on any of your camps, you know she probably, after the fight, is going to take something. You try and get your red, that's first up. Try and get the buff, because you know that just spawned. You know she's not going to have time to do the raptors and the red and the krugs. If she's there, you've spent your gold, you can win. You arrive, you recognize, cool, red buff, yay, bard dies to Nidalee, so you go, oh no, and your raptors are gone. So what do we do? We shout our mid lane, we take the top skull to crab, and we take her top side yet again. As I said, this game was one where we couldn't correct the vertical jungling. Ideally, we never want this, but that's why I like this video, because sometimes when you have to 1v9, you're gonna face these weird situations. Yes, enemy junglers getting fed from dumb things, losing your camps. You know when to back away when you run into a pike. You know, just to give up some of the camps when the enemy support roams in your face. Just kill the Gwen again. That's the free food. That's the winning lane. You're getting fed as well. Now, here's the thing. This might happen again. You might get another kill on the Gwen. The Nidley gets another kill on the bottom side. You're still taking each other's camps. But because you're taking each other's camps so damn quickly now, the downtime between those camps or respawning is a lot greater. This leads to greater dead time. This leads to the ability to actually move around the map without worrying about farm. All camps are off the map. Renekton's taking the top turret. Now you know with this dragon coming up at around 13 to 14 minutes as the early game is about to end, you know you've got to use the gold you have. You're 611, she's 404, you're up about a camp or so, you are in the perfect spot to try and carry this game. First and foremost, if there's a neutral scuttle crab, please make sure you control it. Get good vision, clear stuff out, set a trap. You know the enemy jungler is going to think, oh, we're still doing this thing, you're taking top side, ha 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 ha. I have a feeding mid laner, of course. We all know it's a Yone, we know it's an Oriana, we understand these things. The thing is, Nidley hasn't really translated her lead into the most plates. She hasn't translated her lead into the highest golden experience, whereas you and Renekton have done so. So you set your little trap, you let them start it up, you use the Bard ult and make sure you get those kills. At some point, your lead has to be used in a PvP sense. At some point, you're gonna have to kill people and actually show that you have the advantage. Here's the thing. Finally, now you control your bottom side quadrant, but you know the next objective is already spawning. So this is part of that Korean jungle secret video that I will leave a link below that I made a few weeks ago. It's okay to leave your red and your Krugs because you're going to match the Nidalee going up and force the prior to get the next Herald. The objective control is important. This is the thing about the jungling principles they use in high elo. They know that they need to deny the enemy jungler whatever they want as much as possible. Even if it means they only get 8 out of 10 of what they wanted, if the enemy jungler only gets 5 out of 10 or 4 out of 10, you have the lead. And that's all you need to 1v9 games. It's okay to leave some camps, some objectives to go get the more important ones, which is Herald and making sure Nidalee doesn't get Herald. Even the second one is still useful. And here's where things get really interesting for the takeover. Because again, the mid game is when you truly take over. I just covered this in a private Vokaido GG jungle video that I don't release outside, but I was against the Kindred and I did a solid job denying them, but at a certain point we had similar CS and experience levels, but all of that is a foundation for a moment in the later early game and the mid game transition where you just take a two level lead out of nowhere. Everything is set up for that. So you go ahead, you take your red, your Krugs, and Nidalee now doesn't really know what to do. Both of them walk around a little bit weirdly, kind of thinking that the vertical jungling is still going on, which is a bit strange. But I love doing this, what the Viego does right here. He notices through vision what they're doing, and thus drops the Herald with the Oriana and the Azrael pushing mid lane. I love doing this when a third dragon spawns or so, especially if you can't quite eco the prio and you can't quite have the vision control. Drop it, let it shove. Try and delay the fight, don't die for it, but watch that Herald do work. So here they go for a tier 2 turret. In the meantime, you try and kill people off and stop them from actually, you know, cutting off your Herald. What this does if your team has to now reset and there's nothing for you to do on the map, emphasis. 
If there's nothing for you to do on the map and your team are resetting, don't greet to trap in their jungle. Don't try and be a hero with 3000 gold in your pocket. Simply fall back to your blue side and do a full sequence down the first one all game bless. You go down from one camp to the next, you take everything off the map. You have a great two item spike. You don't have boots, but you don't care. It doesn't matter. Nidalee's completely compromised. You have a two level lead. Look for her, look for a pick. Once your team is back on the map, they've gone back to base, they're reset, they're good. When they're back on the map to follow you and play off of your pressure, or when you're back on the map to play off of theirs, that's when you make your plays like this. Nidalee is now dead. You made the pick right before an objective. Take the objective, go in a jungle, take what's available. They come out again, make a pick before they're able to set up. Ace them, take three people down. It doesn't matter as long as you have numbers advantage. Take the Baron because it's 20 to 21 minutes. This was an exquisite example of matching, handshaking, offsetting pressure, getting fed yourself, getting more fed than the enemy jungler, and using a beautiful extended sequence here to stay out way longer than you would normally recommend. We bought GA in one buy, guys. We didn't upgrade our boots. We just focused on the thing now that's going to allow us to win the game in the next push. We did that by staying out longer than anybody else, playing the map perfectly, recontrolling our cams, making the pick, and immediately translating that numbers advantage into an objective, another one fight, and another objective. That's the big leapfrog movement. You might think, well, I'm equal with the Nidley until 10, 12, 13, 14, 15 minutes, but you set everything up for this. Now you're up by like three levels. I mean, there's nothing they can do whatsoever, sometimes four levels. Truly, you are in control. And obviously now it's a pretty straightforward shoot to the end with picks and Baron pushes and all the fun stuff that comes from having a great item to end. Remember, you've got your stasis, huge AD ratios, Really, there's not much anybody can touch you with, and obviously this is more of a high elo thing, which is why I always link my mid-game guide for the rest of the MMRs below in the description for you to use. But I will say this now, we've had a few of these 1v9 carry jungle games where you can become a certain style jungle by 1v9ing. The Kha'Zix one, we did it beautifully and then we threw, so I showed you how not to throw. That was through a lot of ganking, a lot of control. I showed you the Kane one where we used high pressure ganking roots and high tempo counter jungling and farming to make sure the enemy jungler just got denied and couldn't really play the game. And then this one where the enemy jungler tried to do everything they could to snowball the bottom lane, to snowball the mid lane, to try and take control of you by making you stuck in one quadrant. But if you were the Viego and you played like him, then you would not have allowed it. You got the top laner fed, you saved the mid laner, you got yourself fed. And this Viego shows you exactly how to win, become a total carry jungler, no matter what happens, by using all of our fundamentals in different phases of each of the early games and mid games to get as much as we can, to deny as much as we can, and then wait for that sweet spot moment to take over. And of course, that included a boo-boo moment where we died in the mid lane, but you know what? Not every game is perfect. Playing against high tempo and aggressive junglers who take high risks can be kind of difficult to face. But what if you then took the 99% risk play to become the dominant jungler over them because you understand the chess of jungling while they're only playing checkers? And so let's show how you can become a dominant jungler as we jump into the game, simply by looking two moves ahead and maybe taking a 99% risk play that pays off very quickly. And that's the most important thing. This is from my private Fukai.gg collection where we have jungle video courses, jungle coaching, coaching VOD libraries, weekly coaching classes, Q&As, patch note rundowns, private high yellow streams, as well as a private jungle discord. And now let's bring the teaching voice and begin. When it comes to this sort of aggression, we obviously have a year of first blood, which is why I wanted to show this just so you can see not everybody is fully awake in any game that you play. And this is, <laughs> I love win. This is true for uh, even high yellow, as you can see. So this Diana, and this Nidalee. In order to succeed as a farming jungler here, what are the big things, what are the big words we're thinking about? Two of them, jungle, chess, that's it. They're not big words, but they're loaded words, if you get what I mean. How do we beat the jungle chess game against this Nidalee when she can do so much more than we can? First and foremost, right? We saw the first blood here, the Malphite gets that, loses his flash. So we track that information. Now, what I talk a lot about with Zyra and my champions, and what I tell a lot of you to do in these cases, is to reverse clear, is to ward this buff and avoid the invade, pay attention to where the Nidalee starts, all this good old fashioned stuff. What we can do as well from the Diana's perspective is say, listen, as I watch this develop down here, hey, I could start on the blue side, path upside, and Nidalee, in order to invade me, will have to do this, cut across and do this. Or do this, gank this, and then invade me here. So if my clearing is very, very fast, like it would be, on Akarthus, on, you know, other champions like that, I might be able to get away with it. But at the same time, this is where the chess battle begins. And you're going to see what I mean. So we're going to do blue Grump Wolves. We know the Nidalee is a bit psychopathic at this stage, as they all are. 
you know, she wants to do the red side quadrant into mid lane, but she's going to see this fight that we're watching down here. She is going to rotate to this. Okay, now there's game sound. Sorry, the game sound wasn't working. So basically, she does rotate HCS. We see it, the spear hits. This is what you should do as a juggler. You're doing Krugs, you plan on going all the way up to the Raptors, and there you go. Now, from the Dinah's perspective, cool, I'm crossing, you know, 226, 225, not amazing, but pretty damn good. I can just full clear and do my thing, which is what I've been telling you to do, isn't it? Don't compromise and overreact to a jungle doing something aggressive by trying to do this kind of stuff, by trying to do this kind of stuff before you have to. Now, if this is gankable and we can cut and do it, we'll do it. However, watch what she does. It's very important here that you play your game, but at the same time, while you're doing that, what is the Nidalee going to do afterwards, right? Most likely, she's going to go up, take this, and gank this, or take this and go here, right? Or she could translate directly from the bottom lane all the way up to the mid lane. So we're going to get ahead of the mid lane now. Yes, we don't want to compromise our game plan, and the idea is to full clear, but the root of all jungle success is the chess game of jungle denial. And this Dinah does it better than anyone on a farming jungler. So, we know that the Malphite still has no flash because he went flash queuing to get that first kill. So we shadow here. Why? Because if we tracked him, as we should have, oh, look, there she is. You know, he wards. Again, let's look at this from our perspective. We're watching, and we're watching, and we see him, and he moves up, and he wards, and he comes back. Oh, no, man, I wonder, wonder what he could have done to behave in such a way. He warded. So don't go and sit in this, right? <laughs> kind of like I almost did in that Zyra example last week or two weeks ago. And it was warded. I saw it. Wanted to go for the gank that you saw positioned poorly. And I'm like, well, you've revealed me, so I'm going to walk through it now. Diana doesn't do that. Diana uses the Fog of War here to position well. We have Talia, who's about to ding level 3. That's the most important thing. Once she has level 3, we can actually go in on this. There it is. That's what we're waiting for. Now we position. Look at the Fog of War. You see this? This minion's right here. We're right in the fringe. Exquisite pathing. We want to get ahead of this Nidalee who's most likely going to do this for level 3, and if she went from bottom lane to mid lane, she would have already done so. But again, she'd be level 2, and that's not really very useful. So, we move on in here. No flash. Double E combo. Guy gets stunned. Chase down with Qs. We can obviously follow up with the uh, Diana Q. We flash the Nidalee to get into the minion wave, right? That's the most important thing here. We flash away from the Nidalee to get into the minion wave. So let's look at that again. All right. Whole playthrough again. In real time. She's doing this, we wait for three, no, faster than real time, come on, real time, there we go, hit it, go in, obviously we'll have another Q as long as we do our QE buffer, which is what I talked about in the tips and tricks video, the Nidalee flashes in, we immediately flash, because we don't want to get caught here for execute damage, all of that good stuff, while there's a cannon minion wave, so we want to make sure we get into our minion wave as soon as possible, we are able to hit a Q onto the Nidalee, we're able to get an auto passive onto the Nidalee, and the Talia keeps doing DPS the whole time, Malphite's gonna TP in. Now, mind games, watch this. Mind games. We're low, Nidalee's low, we're moving this way, Nidalee's shadowing us, trust me, you've been in this situation, well, I trust you, you've been in this situation, but trust yourself, you have been in this situation. Passing upwards, we wanna go do this, she knows we did this, uh, but she's Nidalee, she hits one spear, we can die, so what do we do? What would you advise yourself to do here? Just go back to base, right? Ward, go back to base, and defend your red afterwards, but it's a Nidalee. So there's a risk from the Dinah's perspective. So what she says is, okay, look, I'm going to try and face check you, because if you miss a spear, and of course if I hit my Q, I can actually do something about that. So she does hit it, but now walks the other direction, because Malphite immediately moves his big, fat, thick, beautiful body, uh, St. Patrick's says a while ago, into position to cut off the Talia who needs to go back to base. We don't have mid prior. If we did, we can go, but we don't, so we don't. Follow? Good. This means we need to leave. Nidalee sees the rock solid guy, avoid the rock solid of ground, and basically now we're basically just posturing. A lot of basicallys. We walk into the spear. This is where we have to be careful. Nidalee obviously goes in here, uses the flash, and basically now we're like, well, <laughs> what can I do? That's the problem. So it looks on the face of it like, okay, well, why didn't she just leave? Because there's the threat of just losing this, and we're mind gaming the low HP. The Diana is mind gaming that she can actually be able to do this and outplay the Nidalee. But the Nidalee hits that nice max range spear, she uses the flash properly, and she gets the kill. Great, but look at this, you see what I'm saying? Look how easy this is. This is the worry. This was going to happen anyway, right? 100%. But what the Nidalee didn't pay attention to, that the, of course, uh, Diana was trying her best to pay attention to, was the prior of the lanes. 
The Renekton goes over the wall, and he's gonna snack this kill from her. Hopefully, maybe. Let's see. One more order, baby. Oh boy, spacing, healing. Here we go. There we go. Everywhere we go, go. Dinah's like out of base, running directly to this. Oh my goodness, the mobility of this champion is irresistibly annoying. Now, they're busy doing this. It's fine. Mind games, right? Boom. You thought, what an idiot, right? Diana knows. If I go back to base and ward this, I lose my red. Right? It's gone. I waste a lot of time. She wasted a lot of time. I'm on the other side with no camps up. It sucks. I might as well take the risk of fighting this and hoping I can play around her spear chucks. She hits a spear, she goes in, she has flash, I die. Whatever. She will take my red because she's greedy. My top lane has pride because we're necked and strong. He collapses, I chase. Now we're out of base with an Amto and a Dark Seal and Nidley super low. So, by basically saying, listen, you can take this piece off the map, my red, I'm going to take this piece off the map, which is more valuable at this particular stage for you to say out, and obviously, I would love to deny you this, right? There you go. So we take the fight knowing that not only if we lose, do we lose red, but we take it knowing that if we do lose and we lose red, we will be able to get payback very, very easily because we had the prior advantage, and you know, honestly, we could just run in and quickly do the same thing. Huge. Now, the Nidalee knows straight up that this is gone, that this is probably gone. Diana basically can say, hey, listen, I can fall back to this quadrant here. I can look to dive this, but I know Nidalee's going to be coming to the bottom side right now. So what the Diana does is says, okay, I see the Nidalee. I know it's going to happen. Why? Because Nidalee knows that I took this stuff. There's no reason for Nidalee to even go to this side at all. So Nidalee's going to go to the bottom side and take this RNG scuttle. Therefore, instead of falling to the Krugs and the Raptors, as we would normally talk about with our very addictive sequencing, what she does is she says, okay, I'm going to do the Raptors. Watch this develop. Ah, hello, Nidley. Once more, you get free kills. 202, that sucks. Now, ideally, I would want to go and take this, but I can't because obviously everybody's dead, right? But if we did have Pryo, in your games you may have Pryo, could I fight over this and kill and collapse over this? Because I foresee the Nidley going here as well, right? Collapsing it on the shoving lane of Talia vs. Malphite, and because of all the shenanigans, aren't quite yet level 6, only halfway. Because remember, the 5 minute 30 wave is what gives you level 6. 5, 30 to 6 minutes, depending on your elo. In this particular case, we're looking at a lane that is juicy primed for a Nidalee gank. So what does Diana do? Does the wolf camp, and instead of going to the Grump, which is what you were probably thinking of, yes, Rikai, I understand, don't do the Krux Raptors, because now you're behind on tempo. Now you can do nothing, and there's nothing on this side of the map, she'll take all your stuff. Sucks. So we cut out the Krugs. We do the Raptors. We do these camps to defend them against counter jungling, and then we can sync up with our bottom lane, right? You taught us that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You also know this. But, jungle chest between two jungle mines. That's what the game is at its ultimate core. And when you have one champion that can do 40 CS at this stage and another one who has 20, and we're looking at 202 for 011 with no buy, it alters how you perceive the older game. Except it doesn't, because we know what the Nidalee is going to do, so we're going to rotate over to it. And we're going to shadow once more in the Vision Fog of War. And we will wait for the Talia to hit the setup, which is, of course, what we want. Boom, there we go. No flash. We'll make sure we hit our Q combo. And to get the E reset, there we go. E auto attack is primed. We should have another one to chuck, which we do. Double kill. Oh, my goodness. Rakan moves some bottom lanes. Says, I can do something. We say, you know, you can't, you budgie bird. Uh, when you sit here, I'm going to shove this out a little bit to help. Cool. Now. Normally you would say, that's a job well done. Didn't you tell us to go deny? Well, yes, but the problem is Talia's back in base. Rakan's right there. The ADC could rotate. Nidalee could come down to the bottom side as well. And because Nidalee knows when we did the Grump, and we know when we did the Grump, we have the respawn timer of this particular camp. So Nidalee going here would make very little sense. She could go Wolves down for full sequence, but most likely she's going to want to look to do something about the bottom lane. Because Nidalee is winning that. Well, <laughs> Zaya is winning that. But uh, it feels like the Nyla is winning that, if you get my meaning. But also, a spoiler alert, I guess. I let the future compromise my present. Now, without telling Sarah Connor that, if you please, we're going to look at the top lane and see, oh, look, J J Gangplank, Jangplank, uh, you were a little low there. Why don't I just mosey on up to the side and get a dive going? You you're seeing this rotation be very, very dynamic. Oh, look, she went to the bottom side. Even if she did go here and down, it doesn't really matter. She went to Raptors down, right? The Diana decides instead of counter jungling in a somewhat dangerous situation, because Malphite will rotate, Rakan will rotate, ADC will rotate, Nidalee will rotate. Why? When I can just go kill Gangplank. All right, you take some plates, enjoy yourself, Crocodile. See you later, Gucci. And now I know that the Nidalee is going to be on the bottom side here and wanting to basically reverse steal these camps. 
So I'm gonna go back to base immediately. Not waste any time and I want to make sure that this isn't something that can happen. We're watching this 2v2 and you see the Diana here walking on down. Nyla does get the win, which is what I was referencing. Um, apologies for spoiling that. But you can see, all can look amazing. Woof, long range spear, but it isn't always that way, is it? Flashing, oh, the Malfoy gets the kill. Oh look, Diana's here. Oh dear me. Why is the Diana here, says the Nidalee? Well, we can't, where else is she gonna go? Is she gonna do your wolves into the grump and then, uh, what? So the Nidalee wasn't doing the same kind of chess game, just playing checkers. The Diana was playing chess the whole time. And then, yes, it does include sometimes taking a fight that looks a little doomed because you know you're gonna get it back. One step back, two steps forward. Risk is there because you're basically playing on your own skill and knowledge. And I love this little fog of war gap as well which is what we always want to abuse as much as possible. We have alt. We talked about the uh, full-on Diana combat in the Tips and Tricks video as well. Beautifully done. 5 4 one, one to 2-2-3, two, two, and just now it was 2 0 2 to 0 one, one Look at the shift, all because of those mind games. And now instead of focusing on this, of course, Herald play, we're gonna go straight for the, the dragon. So the, why I like this was because farming junglers typically aren't gonna have that same snowball potential to take these, right? To take these Heralds. So what we do is, oh look, she killed my top laner, she's gonna take my Krugs, whatever, man, don't care. That's it. The Dinah won the mind game, she has uh, 4,464 gold to 3,500 gold on the Nidalee. We obviously are going to pay attention to this as well as we witness it. Cool. Now my stuff's probably been taken to some degree from the Dinah's perspective. If you lost all of these camps and you got here, you'd know that you had time to collapse on the Herald. But because these camps are available, you know that the Nidalee is in fact taking the Herald, the Global Timer goes off. Now we see the Nidalee with the Global Timer going off, finishing the Herald, collapsing on our Rock Lady with the Rock Solid Man. We don't finish our Red. We reactively path immediately, immediately, so we can go ahead and impact this fight as well. Hello, I'm Super Fed, are you? And that's the absolute power of winning the mind game strategy of jungle. Incredible, isn't it? How different it is when you've got a Challenger Grandmaster game with the challenge of farming jungler gets in Italy, really seeing two steps ahead of that player. And if we jump forward, and not a lot happens. Diana just straight up carries and Nyla straight up carries. It was really a runaway stomp. So I don't want to cover that because that's really irrelevant, right? Because at this particular point, you're only 3k up, right? You're 3k up in gold. You know, it's very difficult to, to beat a Diana when she's <laughs> 71 to 44 CS and has done so much damage. Look, you've been jungle diff. It's okay. It's okay to not be the better jungler in the game. What's not okay is not doing something about it. The game you had just before this where you were jungle diff, that's the last time that happens. In this video, we are going to be going over three ways that you can juggle more mercifully, more efficiently, and just damn better than 99% of other junglers. So I'm gonna start off by talking about the early game when we have two equal junglers in terms of CS, and then I'm just gonna cut away for a brief example about what you could do if you were a farming jungler in terms of true and utter denial and deconstruction of the enemy jungler to get, you know, like a 50-60 CS lead by 14 minutes. Mix of jungle fundamentals as you watch this first Blood Fiesta, and I thought, hey, why don't we find a game where basically a lot of people would complain about laners or say, wow, the game was doomed, we were always doomed to lose. And, okay, replay glitch. We will always look at games through the lens of the pain sufferer, right? In this case, the Lolia. And that's the problem, okay? We have here an early level one fight, and I'm sure most of you are used to seeing those in your games, and you end up compromised with your leashless start. So in this particular case, no wards placed by red side are living, no wards placed by blue side are living. So the lily is gonna go to the red, sorry, the blue. The leeson's gonna go to the wolves. What do you think he's gonna do next? Think about it, what does Lily want to do? Blue, Gromp, wolves, raptors, red, krugs, she might be a little concerned about Lee Sin potentially invading her. The issue here is we swapped for Scanner, our wood was destroyed, we don't see anything from the blue side's perspective. That can make things a little difficult for us in these kinds of positions. If you want help implementing this information into your own game, I have a free jungle improvement resource and a dedicated program where we have jungle video courses, jungle coaching, coaching VOD libraries, weekly coaching classes, Q&As, patch note rundowns, private high elo streams, as well as a private jungle discord. And I know how to make junglers convert from low elo to gold to emerald to diamond to master plus. If you want to climb faster than anybody you know, jungle diff every game you play, head to vukayu.gg. Don't mind the rather be here. So what I like to do in these particular cases is actually not reverse clear. I sequence and I try a little bit of action or I sequence and kind of play it super safe. And I really hope that the Leeson shows up first. 
and I might actually go from Raptus around the back here. I'll drag Raptus, go around the back, check if Red's up. If it is, I'll go to Krugs. What that allows me to do is buy a lot more time for the Leeson to show, but also if he does decide to invade, I won't be there half HP taking a red buff, you know what I mean? So those are the kinds of things I like to think about when I'm a farming jungler against that sort of potential aggression. Lee Sin, on the other hand, you think, oh, probably he's going to do walls, you know, down to his Grumpa Blue. He can get bottom lane here, you know, Aphilius, no sums, Soraka, no sums, uh, Renekton, no sums, and then you're looking at here, no sums, and uh, this guy's Hex Flash. So the map is open at this particular stage, but overall, it's a neutral start, right? Regular stuff. Now... If you're the Lee Sin and you know that the Lilia is going to know that you might decide to invade, if you follow me, what can you do to kind of offset that? You can go for a hyperactive clear, which kind of covers your bases. Because if Lilia thinks that Lee Sin is going to steal her red, what will Lilia do? Vertical jungle, right? If you have vision here and assume that the Lee Sin's going to invade this, then you're not going to waste your time doing this and farming down. You're just going to go blue, crop, and probably take a red, right? Maybe take this and gank this, or take this and gank this. You know, there's a lot of mind gaming going on here, but the Lee Sin makes First Blood Jungle Death Brain. By that I mean, he goes Wolves into the red. This protects him. It gets him potential vertical jungling of the Lilia, which she would make out of fear that he was actually taking her red buff. And the whole point of this video is to show you, sometimes games aren't doomed, sometimes you just get jungle diff. That's it. It isn't doomed, you just get out jungled. And how then do you play around that? So... Renekton shoves out the Renekton, no flash uses the advantage. Lilia says, okay, don't know where Lee Sin is. I'm, please don't be a Raptors, please don't be a Raptors. Oh, my Raptors are here. I'm so happy. Scanning to make sure that she didn't ward because I wasn't sure. Maybe the Lee Sin warded, I don't know. I'm freaking out a little bit. Just gonna make sure I get my Raptors. That's literally what's going through your mind here, okay? Now what you could do is try use an E on the red and just go straight to your Raptors. But if Lee Sin came down here directly, then hey, you know, he could have done this already. So from the Lily's perspective, it's a case of... I'm not entirely sure what the Lee Sin is doing at all. And therefore, I'm just going to go ahead and gank the fact that the Syndra's in the mid lane, and Jace, you know, has a flash, and Syndra has a flash, and it's just a regular lane with a regular clay. However, look at Jace's HP. She has compromised herself now, her sequencing, her opportunity to gank this lane, where subs, while Ziri has subs, your bottom lane has none. So you kind of want to try and get the Ziri on equal footing, right? Like, no subs, Nautilus has no flash as well, so we can kind of use that to our advantage and use the full clear to our advantage, right? If the Lee Sin's mind gaming himself because he hasn't shown yet, then at least we have that control. So she goes for this. Look at the wave. It's fat, it's juicy, and Jace's chunk. This is no longer a gank that we can do. Also, look at her posturing. Where's she going? Top side of the lane. Okay. So in this particular case, why would she posture top side with her flash up here? It's always a giveaway for mid laners. Let's have a look. Boom. Always have this in your mind. When they posture and move in a direction and you don't know where the enemy jungler is, assume he is there. And the Jace, unfortunately, doesn't do such things. And uh, Lisa says, yo, what's up, Q, with the Q missing HP on the Q2. Lily is now taking that full-ass wave and will, in fact, die. Give away all information. 16 CS, blue buff, no red, Lisa knows. So, the Syndra's going to push this out from Lily's perspective. He's going down. Lily's like, well, he might be taking my blue, my, my red, excuse me. So I've called this a red and I've called this a blue. Yeah, so that's how you know I'm sick. Also missed a lot of Zyra E's at the weekend. It's unlucky. Happens, though. So now we're worried about, hey, is the Lee Sin taking my, my red? Now, have you noticed how this whole thing so far has been about trying to assume what the Lee Sin is doing? The Lee Sin is in the head. The Lee Sin made the cool call of saying, the only disadvantage I have on this champion is if I do this and invade you and you get a vertical jungling situation. We lose then because I'm giving you what you want farm. If you think I'm going to invade you and I take away the possibility, not only will I have a nice wolf red crug, which is a clear I've covered Many times in the past, it's an old clear, but it still checks out. 100% can do this into a top lane gank. It just doesn't have the same efficiency on the second, third rotation, but when it comes to uh, reverse clearing, you can do this and down. Okay, not ideal because you normally would cut here, you know, or gank mid lane, you kind of take this full back, whatever. But the idea is that this can will respawn at your 355 marker, right, early. So you fulfill this time being active the whole, the whole phase of the early game, and then you can fall back to sort of your blue grump wolves, which would be the second spawn, as like a second phase thing. But I mean, we're not really talking about that clear because it doesn't have effectiveness in general. I'm just kind of mentioning, hey, this is a thing that people used to do on Rek'Sai, especially wolves, red crugs, gang top lane, cool, done, season nine. Now we don't do it. He just did it now to cover himself from the Lilia. 
But is my red available? Okay, phew, it is. Which means Lee Sin fell back down to the blue side quadrant, and he's probably doing this. Because we saw the Lee Sin come from the top side, right? With 12 CS and a red buff. But we know he walked back to his blue side, and he had to have started on the walls, right? Because he had no blue. But did he make it in time to the Raptors somehow? That's probably what most people would think in the moment, right? We have the benefit of the replay. In the moment, you're probably thinking he just did red side quadrant. Leeson shows up here with the blue buff. We see that being taken. We move on down. Aphilius is being baited out. Hey, this happens to everybody. This happened to me the other day too. ADCs are not intelligent people most of the time. And if they are, they'd stop playing ADC. They could go load another role for a bit. Now, we know this is down. So we hit this so that he knows where we are. But mostly that we can see stuff. If he, is he falling back to his Grump? See, the wolves are up now. Is he falling back to Grump Wolves? Is he available for me to maybe go take? Is it available on the top side? Is a Scuttle Crab available on the top side? We got there eventually. The Lee Sin, this is where the jungle diff begins. You get smacked in the face by this plant right now. You know it's the Lilia. Most of you, 99% of you, even me, with my obsession of a sequencing, would probably go back to this because that's what our champions allow. But if you play the Rex size, and the Lee Sins, and the, and, the, and the Briars, and the Belveths of this world, and the Javans of this world. No, no, no. The definition of jungle denial, the definition of jungle difference is about to occur. Watch this. We, no, not that. What We use our E so they know where we're going to the top side to take the Scuttle Crab. Lee Sins says, I know you're going to the top side to take that Scuttle Crab because most likely you assume I'm doing my grump on my wolves. So what I'm going to do is shout out my raptors from counter jungling. Okay. I see you do this. And boom. Look at this. This is it. This is GG. This is GG. She revealed herself multiple times in suboptimal situations. The only time where it was okay was, was, was here. But because she revealed herself here and died, and then threw the, the swirl seed, the E down here, the Lisa knows exactly what you're doing. Now you should top it for the kill, which is which is great, right? You know, hey, I'm ganking, ha ha ha. Yes, ha ha. Ganking, ha. Uh, this is so great. Fat wave two. All right, bye. You just telegraphed everything, man. You have no HP. You're going down to your jungle camps. Did Leeson take this or did Leeson go back to base and come topside? And even so, did Leeson take these things, stay out to sequence, see this and thinks, hey, I can kill you base itemization anyway. That's the coin flip here. That's it. Leeson says, I know where you're going. I tracked your CS because, hey, you got 24, right? And that's the thing. If she goes 4, 8, 12, 16, all right, and then she shows up here, she dies. Then she hits the plant here, we don't see anything. She crosses here, and then she shows top lane. It's like, okay, she did 20, she did the crux, uh, the scuttle crab, 24. She's falling back to a grump of the wolves, because I know she took no other camps other than the red and the scuttle since I last killed her. So, you know she's going to be here. Hello! What do you do for your Lilia? Is the game doomed? Or is it lost to do jungle death? Leave. She's greeting for the smite. All right. She's greeting for the smite. Doesn't even get it. And in doing so, because this guy had TP and that wave was fat and juicy, which I pointed out, guess what's gonna happen next? Exactly. Renekton channels his base. She cancels her base. In this particular case, you've got to sit on top of the Renekton, sync up your bases as much as possible, and try and get out of there. Because you're dying. Which he did. Now, does Leeson stay to take my wolf camp? I have no idea. So what do we do? We have to go down to the bottom side and assume he might actually do that. Does he now go to his Krugs? Does he reset? He does go to his Krugs. Does he reset thereafter? I would assume he does. Now, if you're Leeson and you go back to finish your Krugs, you have a nice quadrant clear. Boom. All clear off the map. Thumbs up. Excellent stuff. Where do you go next? Bottom side. Why? Because you know that the Lilia has to assume that you could take her wolves and then fall back to the Krugs. And you could also just take your wolves and go back to base. You could also just straight up go, like, you could do anything. And when we're thinking about the game from Lily's perspective like this, you're losing. The guy's playing you. End of story. And that's a jungle denial that we're talking about, because she's only got 24 CS in six minutes. So she thinks, okay, why don't I go ahead and do my Raptors? Oh, it's warded, of course, because if you watch the Syndra and you watch the supports and they, oh, this looks tasty. Yeah, but... This guy knows it looks tasty because he has eyes. He also knows you're going to the bottom side. So much like the challenge of videos on the main channel, you know, you might think you're getting away with this, but the enemy jungler, the Gurins, the Canyons, the top tier uh, foresters of our world. 
They know these things. They track these things. They anticipate these things. And that's where they control you. So what would I learn from this particular game being shut down this hard? First and foremost, play my game early. And I've been saying this a lot personally, all right? We're losing this game. It's, it's out of hand. Random stuff's happening. I'm not going to continue to try and make our plays forcefully. What can I do right now while everyone is dying, all the lanes are dying, the enemy jungle is getting filled? What can I do? I can sequence and control my own camps. I'm going to do that. As soon as he shows somewhere else, like say he shows bottom lane and I'm sequencing here, I'm out. I'm basing before that play even happens and I'm swapping back top side. Maybe he can get some counter jungling or, or, or a herald or something. Anything. Most of the time it's counter jungling. But also you're going to have a lot of people uh, giving up heralds for dragons uh, strategically in these situations, which you will see in this game as well. So I'll get to that. But the idea is that you are not dying unnecessarily and you still have 50 CS to his 40. And that's the thing. If the lineage is full cleared, recognized that Jace was doomed anyway and accepted that, try to do something on the bottom side because she assumed he started wolf. She assumed he started here. And he hadn't shot it by three minutes, which means we assume he's in our top side. So if I can just full sequence down, which was her intent here, do it. Play away from the guy who you know is going to kill you. End of story, right? So now Lee Sin is... Tracked her multiple times and cut off multiple times. Jace goes for this trade. He does, in fact, miss the Q of the wall, so decides just to flash full on commit, which is, of course, exactly what you do in those cases. Jungle diff move. She's going to be doing this. Spotted on this ward, which, of course, we like. Still gives value. She has to spend time killing it. We see her, which means we can now take all her camps on this side. Now, the jungle diff move is what I said. Control your camps, right? Let him do his stuff and just don't give anything for free, but you don't die. And now, if we see the list in here, we go take all of this, right? We can control all, all of these things because our camps are under control. But because our camps are not under control, Lee Sin knows he can go take them. So now we're losing our camps as well. We go down to the bottom lane with the Syndra, get ourselves a nice turret dive on the unicorn thing, goat thing. I see a moon man say, so you can die as well. Okay, nice dive, good macro. Lily says, fine, I'll take the Herald. He says, I don't care. Because it's about gold. The Herald is about gold at this particular point for the Lilia. You want to use this for plates, that's it. And he's like, I just got way more than you ever going to get from plates. And I denied your own camps. Yeah, they're going to respawn, but still. So what he does, hears that Herald go ding, takes his Ocean Dragon, sees the red spawning, okay. Assumes that this particular stage, you can look, my bottom lane is out of the picture here. Could I go for this? Only if Lilia shows. Only if our bottom lane is in position, which of course they're not. So he doesn't go for the high risk throw, which most people would actually do. She says, oh, I get to control my camps. Cool. Could have also done some counter jungling. Chose not to because negative prio. The negative prio exists because of the mistakes at the beginning. So the better the jungler, the more those early mistakes are going to haunt you, the more difficult the game is going to be. That's the difference between a challenger and a grandmaster even. So you can imagine the difference between then a grandmaster and a master and then, you know, like a challenger and a diamond and a diamond, right? It, it just keeps getting bigger. Huge. When you think about these things. So the Lisa then falls back into his camps here. Sees the Nautilus roaming and warding. Finally, time to relax and do some farming because I've imparted my wisdom and my lead to the lanes. Cool, I'm going to do that. Lilia's like, whew, I got some camps. Cool. Yeah, that's nice. Okay, good. Well, guess what? The Lisa knew you were topside, so he knew you did this. He also knew you did this. He also knows now that if you fall back to your red side there, which most likely you did to control your camps... Uh, you're going to be back on the top side. Yeah? You're going to be back on the top side. So, he can either decide to match you, fist you, destroy you, and so on. Or he can say, hey, I see a play made mid lane. Maybe I could make that play myself. Unfortunately for us, the Syndra gets the kill, so we get nothing. But the intent is good. Lilia shows up randomly, and there's a mistake. Now you're saying, but why on earth would Leeson be down here? The Leeson should be coming top side. Exactly. Exactly. The Lisa knows that the Lilia will think that he's on the top side, so he doesn't do that. Who cares about his camps? Her camps are up, and I can take them. And if she comes down here, I will kill her. And if she takes my camps, I don't give a shit, because I'm going to kill them and take all the plates. You follow? It's really tough. It's all about, I know what the enemy jungle thinks I'm going to do, so I'm going to do the opposite. And when you have such a big lead, that's when jungle denial becomes quite intense. And again... If the Lilia doesn't show up here, doesn't rotate to this, and just takes all of this, she might have a better time. But then again, she has negative lane prior. So it's all compounded from those first mistakes. Renekton does move down here, but hey, the Lee Sin is a fed boy. 
And he's a strong champion who's getting buffed again for zero particular reason. But now you're seeing no more jungle denial. So where's Lily going? Top side, because why? He knows he's down here. Free plates. Shadowing. Lee Sin cleared this ward. We see the pet here, so we kind of see this from our perspective. No one's really going to notice an in-game. Hello, goat. A little bit of a kick Q combo. Get some slows, get some shields, get some lifesteal. Does a heal. Misses that Q, so she will live. Safeguard back to the Ziri. Moon Man tries to do some stuff, but his moon is made of cheese. Okay, sorry, I chuckled at that and gave myself an asthma attack. So basically, the Aatrox is dead. We're going to activate our Herald here, which is terrible because Jace has got some kills. The Renekton is going down to the bottom lane to try to do stuff here again, but he just died. He's going to die again. You know, this is silly. We could have hit the plant, moved on up, actually hit this, take this whole thing with him. Do the turret damage. What did I tell you? Even in losing game states, you have opportunities to hit turrets. She is not doing that. So, from her perspective, it seems doomed. From her perspective, she's being jungle diffed. From his perspective, he's doing extreme jungle denial. But she's also not doing the things that could allow her to survive in this game and maybe make a comeback later on. Will it be difficult? Yes. Of course. Now, could she go to this side again? Yes. I think I might even hazard, honestly, in this particular case, I move up, I hit this. Now I've got the presence. We hit this turret together. We get the kill. I can shadow and maybe take something, right? Fall back down to take this outside and rule and then fall back. Put a control ward here. That's when you win, right? All of a sudden, you've eked out a little bit of push and presence, taking something, fall back and take something else, gotten some vision control, Okay, plates, cash monies, and we're good to go. Yeah, we're good to go. And then maybe you can win the game. Now, unfortunately, we didn't do those things. And of course, you can see the Renekton decided uh, he, in fact, did not want to win the game. And, uh, you know, here we go. Lee just runs into Lilia. And this is besides the point. I really, I mean, most of you here are, could you end up carrying this game with this guy trolling? Hell no. But the problem is you have these games. And nine times out of ten you have these games, there's no troll. People are just dying. People are just playing badly. And... You're the one that has to carry them. Is this game winnable? Pfft, tough, but definitely possible. It starts from level two, though. It starts from level three. It starts from understanding what you need to do. However, when you're playing the Lee Sin's position, this is exactly what you do to give yourself a 95% chance to win this game. So think of it from the Lee Sin's perspective. Change your mentality. Because most of you are probably thinking of this from the Lily's perspective. And the troll. And the difficulty of having this guy do this to you. Stop. Swap. Become the Lee Sin. And that's the lesson. I want to show you what happens on the other side of the coin. We have a Singed here, okay, with a tank nidalee top lane. I've seen some weird things lately. Now, he's proxying. Most junglers know at this point, don't let this compromise you. Don't let this compromise the mini game of your jungle matchup and understand where exactly you want to go ganking and where you expect to have lane prior and such things. Thing is, obviously, we're going to speed run this a little bit. We have here the Lee Sin going for the Singed, right? Okay, going all in, ward hopping. Guy's going to flash and plant away, right? Now you compromise. Because the enemy jungler will see you and say, huh, maybe there's something we can do about this. In this particular case, the Zyra decides to actually go on the top side, basically saying, can I risk a little bit of time here to maybe kill him and maybe steal blue? The reason why you go around the top side and not underneath is because it's warded. But obviously, this is clearly a mistake because I think if you approach from Fog of War here, you've got max range E, you probably have a better shot, although you don't have smite and he does. So all in all, I think you probably should not do this. And seeing him here on this red team vision, it's better just to cut down and do what is going to happen next. So focus on that here rather than what's happening now. Also, because you need to pay attention to the lanes, just keep an eye on that. Look, you see Singes is in base. The Nidalee is on the top side. We hit a plant. We chuck out, obviously, an E there. We're going to electric your proc. Now, immediately in these particular cases, usually you see the movement pretty quick, okay? Even if there's an HP compromised laner, the 3v1 equals you probably die. You could maybe turn a kill depending on your champion. But a lot of the time, I don't see junglers basically say, you know what? This was over aggressive. I coin flipped a little bit. I'm in a bad spot. Let me just flash out. Why wait for the inevitable flash where you get HP compromised? You lose the HP war. Don't do that. Flash now and cut across. Now, from red team's perspective of the vision, watch this. We will see the least sin and where he goes next. Compromised, HCS, going to his grump. Cut across mid lane for a drive by. It doesn't matter that he knows where you're going because you know if you're watching the lanes, that it's not warded anywhere, right? You know it's clean. So he thinks you're going to be going to this side most likely, or maybe to drive by to bottom lane. But if you understand the concept of pathing more eloquently, efficiently, masterfully, being just better overall, and you want to flame horizon a guy, what you do is you say, thank you so much for your raptors. And we can speedrun this. He shows on the ward. He's going to the wolves. We take this away. We look bottom lane for a gank, but we don't necessarily want to show too much. Although I think it's pretty obvious that the guy is going to cut up and do his uh, topside scuttle crab. We don't know if he's going to come down to this and this, or if he's going to go to the scuttle crab. 
He shows up here with 16 CS. Red, blue, Grump Wolves. That means this is still available. So he goes for the gank here. Good play by him, as expected. Right, we get the kill. Nice. Zyra in the meantime says, all right, well, I took this and I took this. He's going to help her push this a little bit. Because we did red, Krugs, Raptors, this will respawn right now, 415. Well, 415 to 420. And then you should have this at your regular timer. So he's going to this right now, which is great. Do the Grump after the blue. Do the Wolves after the blue. Here we go. Perfect sequencing into that 4 minute 40, uh, 4 minute 45 Raptor camp, okay? And while you do this, you basically hope that the Lee Sin isn't cut up to take these camps. I don't think it's likely. Most likely he's gonna be on the bottom side resetting. You ward anyway. Oh, there he is, okay. A Little bit of safety, but I don't think it's necessary in most cases. As you know, in the moment you think differently, you kind of hedge, you know, A option, B option about where the enemy jungle will go. So successfully, you've taken this quadrant, this quadrant, this quadrant, minus the red buff, and a second rotation here, plus a bottom scuttle. He has nothing to do on the bottom side. So, shows up, tries to get something going, roam from the support. Now we see the Lee Sin do this, and this is a big wave, chunked HP singed. Let's see if we can get a gank off here before he shows up. Pretty terrible gank overall, but it doesn't really matter that's a terrible gank. The point is a little bit of pressure here, shoving out, biding some time, and preventing perhaps a preventable dive. You saw the Lee Sin show very briefly, all right? So now basically what you're gonna say, look, I don't really care about this too much. I'm gonna go back to base and spend my cash money gold. The Lee Sin is like, okay, well, I got nothing else to do. He literally sits here. Remember, the whole time this is happening, the goal for you is to take this and this again. You gave it to me once, through one mistake, you're not seeing it again. Jungle Denial, Jungle Diff, pathing mercifully. The Lee Sin, we would have pressed tab, seen 20 CS, okay? So we're waiting for this, waiting for this, waiting for this. You think he's over here, which I think is reasonable. Then what's gonna happen is he's gonna show top side on this dive, eventually. There he is, there he is. There he goes, and because we see this, kill, cool, no assist, beautiful. You can path, always hug the wall, yes. Bracket pathing, outside in, touch the wall. Don't get spotted by any wards that may exist there. You take the second spawn raptors. And now you can basically decide, do I want the red buff or do I want the crud? Because at this particular stage, you know the Lee Sin obviously will fall back down to his blue side, but look for a gank, a good opportunity here uh, to try and do something. It's obviously warded, zone the karma, get the assist, no stress, all right? Don't worry too much about anything else other than uh, <laughs> the fact that the gank is good. And you know Lee Sin at this point is on the top side, so we can go ahead and take the Krugs as well, over the wall. There we go. Could do something here as well, but, you know, I don't really like hedging those kinds of things. You just say, what can I deny the enemy jungler today? And usually that's how we talk about stuff. Draven dies 2v1, doesn't really matter. Lee Sin was seen on the top side. Now Karma shows up here, we'll clear this vision. No prior midline. Can we gank it? I think we can. Let's go. Boom. Force the flash out. We'll take that. Wasn't going to hit, but we'll take it. Now, why do we go to the top side here and not to the bottom side? We go to the top side because we know the Lee Sin, okay, would have done his blue side, is going to go either down to his red side to take the camps he thinks are available, or if he's paying attention and tracking CS, he's going to cut up and take away this stuff so that he can dive the Sinch again and get Herald control. That's what he should be doing. However, if you have the lead, you can basically say, look, I think if he is here, with Panther being up and LeBlanc being out of the picture, we can take him. We can do stuff. 60 CS to 36 CS. Oh, look, it's available. How blessed. Cool. Take it all. Free. All right. No, the Lee Sin is over here. Guy's going to go to the Dragon. I think that's pretty obvious at this stage. Singe is going to proxy. Panther alter the top lane. You take a Herald. Lee Sin shows up. Guy's just looking for camps. Look at this. He's lost. He doesn't know what to do. So now you can just go ahead and do the Herald. Very, very free, very easy, very juicy. Thank you. And then, with Lee Sin investing way too much time on the bottom side, now we can finally open up the can of worms and affect the mid lane. Hello, LeBlanc, yes, sir. Go for that, proc it, she goes back, double stun. Sorry, double slow from the plants, activate this, and now your Pantheon, all of a sudden, despite being ganked twice, gets fed. Cool, huh? Look at the CS gap, 78 to 40. And now you fast forward again, and you keep going. Obviously, at this point, you don't take the bottom side quadrant. You see the least in there, purely because you don't have the ability to, to guarantee laner roams. And you haven't reset at this particular stage. It was 2.8k gold. There we go. 1v1 battle. See the least in moving? So this is a case where, do you go back to base and spend your cash monies? Or are you strong enough and see the, an opportunity enough to clean up and counter gank as well? Because you see the least in, 
You gave him some free camps, but we don't like that necessarily. So, and when you think, okay, look, I can go ahead and do this. Make sure you scan on approach just to ensure if it's warded or not. She dodges your E, but you get the 60% stack slow. You get the knock up on the Lee Sin and the LeBlanc. And uh, plants plus Qs equals deadly Lee Sin. 202, 108 CS, 58 CS. Gold amount, 5.7 by 13 minutes. My metric is 6k gold by 14 if you want to be the 1v9 carry. That's a good thing to head towards. 